Board of Directors meeting. As you might notice, I am not Jackie Malay. She saw that it was going to be raining in Denver and uh, went to Mexico. So I know let's take a moment and feel, feel really sad for her sitting on a beach. And uh, I will promise to get us out of here before 9. So now I might have to cut somebody off mid-sentence, but we're out of here by 9. All right, so let's begin with uh, our call to order. Oh, don't you? Oh, no, roll call. Pledge of Allegiance, my, if we will all rise. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And now we move on to the roll call. Eva Henry, Eric Hansen, Bill Holen, Here. Elise Jones, Here. Dennis Harward, Here. Tim Mock, Tom Hayden, Here. Chrissy Fanganello, Here. Robin Kniech, Here. Roger Partridge, Dave Weaver, Gail Watson, Connie McLean, Don Rozier, Bob Pfeiffer. Here. Bob Roth. Here. Jim Peters. Larry Vidham. David Spellman. Suzanne Jones. Here. Ann Justin. Here. Lynn Baca. Cynthia Martinez. George Teal. Yes. Kathy Noon. Here. Ron Engels. Catherine Hyder. Laura Chrisman. Here. Gail Christie. Richard Champion. Jim Benson, Rick Teeter, Debbie Nasta, Joe Baker, Todd Riddle, Laura Keegan, Joe Jefferson, Here. Dan Woog, Mark Gruber, Joyce Thomas, Here. George Heath, Samantha Mearing, Lisa Jones, Laura Brown, Henry Ergot, Paula Bovo. Lynette Kelsey is here. Yay. Sorry, Lynette. Thank you. Uh, Doris Ragoni, Sersha Karras Graves, Here. Ron Rakowski, Present. Mike Hillman, Brad Weasley, Stacey Luberger, Shakti, Here. Jerry Bean, Phil Sunanik, Bruce Beckman, Jackie Malay, Jim Gunning, Gabe Santos, Here. Ashley Stolzman, Here. John O'Brien, Connie Sullivan, Colleen Whitlow, Richard Kraber, Deborah Jerome, Sean Foray, Chris Larson, Joe Gearlock, Joyce Downing, Carol Dodge, John Dyack, Gary Howard, Landau De Laguna, Rita Dozel, here, Val Vigil, Herb Atchison, here. Joyce J, Bed, um, Bud Starker, Gary Sanford, Deborah Perkins Smith, Bill Van Meter, here. and we do have a quorum. All right, we have a quorum. Um, next, we typically uh, welcome and introduce new members. I do not see Jim Peters from Bennett. Is he here? If he were here, I'd introduce him as the new Sue Horn, but <laughs> I guess that will have to wait. And Lynette, we don't see you here very often, so welcome. And am I missing any other new faces? Welcome all you old faces as well. I just wanted to uh, introduce Council Member David Beacom from Broomfield, who's here with me tonight. He's not the alternate yet, but might be in a week. So, anyway. <laughs> well, here's hoping we don't scare him off. <laughs> Thanks for being here in the audience. So, we'll move on. Um, might I um, have a motion to approve the agenda? I so move. Motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Well, I didn't say. Uh, any any opposition? Motion passes unanimously. I was going to allow our esteemed CDOT director to uh, go first, but since he's not here, we'll uh, move on with our first strategic informational briefing with a presentation on the alternative fuels project from Steve McCannon from the RAC. And Steve, unfortunately, is feeling under the weather today, so we'll try to be nice to you. Thank you, Elise. I appreciate that. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for having me. 
My name is Steve McCann, and I'm the Mobile Sources Program Director for the RAC. Here today to talk about our Charge Ahead Colorado and Alt Fuels Colorado programs. So, over the past two to three years, we've been running the Charge Ahead and Alt Fuels Colorado programs. I think one thing that uh, that we need to be aware of is that these programs need to be taken together to look at how we are advancing the alt fuels market for electric CNG and propane vehicles and infrastructure. They need to be taken together. Um, over the past two to three years, probably four years, we've, multiple stakeholder groups have sat down and talked about these projects to de develop the infrastructure, policy, and marketing and outreach for these programs. One of the things that uh, I'd like everybody to be aware of is that we fund applications that are submitted to us. We don't go out and build stations. So we're looking to our local government partners and our private partners out there to develop these either electric charging stations, natural gas charging stations. So I'll go into the Charge Ahead Colorado program first. So Charge Ahead is a pr uh, partnership between the RAC and the Colorado Energy Office. Uh, it's designed to incentivize the widespread early adoption of electric vehicles and infrastructure. Um, we're trying to get the key locations, spread that infrastructure to address range anxiety. The RAC uses Dr. Cog awarded CMAC funds for electric vehicles and electric vehicle uh, charging stations, and CO has state funding for their charging station development outside this area. So you can see the funding overview. We provide a level, different levels of funding from level two single port is 3260 uh, on that uh, charging station and $16,000 for level three uh, charging station. So that's your DC fast charge. So, and then on the other side of the program, the RAC provides funding for electric vehicles. So we'll pay $8,200 against the increment of that electric vehicle compared to its gasoline equivalent. So, Awards to date, the RAC has had $2.7 million in the kitty. We've expended about $1.2 million, and we have about $1.5 million remaining for this project. We plan on having more funding coming to Dr. Cog for more funding for these projects. Uh, overall, we've awarded about 70 charging station projects. Uh, so those can be multiple charging stations within an application. So we've got 68 level two chargers installed and 89 in progress around the Denver metro area. We've got two level three DC fast chargers installed and two in progress. And 37 electric vehicles for government and nonprofit fleets. With the electric vehicles, oh, you jumped me. <laughs> Sorry, I was gonna go back. Uh, with the electric vehicles, only nonprofit and governmental in entities that are uh, not eligible for the state income tax credit can come in on the project. So it's this group, it's nonprofits, it's universities. Thanks, Steve. So just wanted to show everybody where the charging stations in the metro area were. It's kind of a point and, point and go. Uh, if anybody has any questions, you can ask me. So of course, wanted to throw up the uh, Denver metro area funded organizations so you could see uh, who in the area has been funded. Uh, it is our, it, it is a lot of our usual suspects that are here <laughs> and multiple private companies and HOAs. So I'll also be speaking for Wes Mauer tonight, the transportation manager for the Colorado Energy Office. So be kind to me on these slides. CO has funded $450,000 in charging station projects to date and has about $350,000 in state fiscal year 2015 for electrification. They've done 81, 81 level two chargers and two level three chargers. At the beginning of this project, two to three years ago, we had 79 publicly accessible stations. With RAC and CO funding, there are more than 250 stations available today. So we've built this out in a very short period of time. So charging stations statewide, this is just an expanded view of the state. You can see that everything, uh, a lot of what the state has done has been north to west. We're still missing the east to south pieces, so we'll be out pounding the pavement trying to get those folks involved in this project. So the RAC uh, AFC vehicle program, you know, this is our uh, second program. It is a $45 million cash money project. So there's, there, thankfully this group understands the alphabet soup of partners that are listed up there. So it's CEO, the RAC, CDOT, DOLA, Federal Highways, 
and Noble Energy on a partnership of this project. The RAC has $15 million in CMAQ funds dedicated to vehicles within the 11 county program area. And that's the ozone non-attainment area and the carbon monoxide uh, maintenance areas. CO has $15 million dedicated for the infrastructure statewide. DOLA has $10 million. It used to be $20 million. They've cut that back a little bit. And then Noble Energy has come in with another $2 million for matching funds in the RAC program area. And it's about $3 million for Weld. With Noble Energy, they're really focused on natural gas school buses. So those are the folks they're helping within this project. So just wanted to show you a quick uh, take of the RAC vehicle program area. I won't go over all the counties, but that is a box that Steve did not create. That is a box that is created through MAP 21 in the Federal Highway Administration's guidance. <laughs> so how much funding do we have out there? Uh, we've got 80% of, or how much can we cover? We've got 80% of the incremental costs that we can cover on an AFV um, compared to the conventionally fueled diesel equivalent. It could be a gas as well. Uh, private fleets may be eligible for added tax credits. The way we've structured this program is our nonprofit and public fleets get about double what the private entities get. So for, an, for instance, the heavy duty fleets in the public sector get $35,000 against that incremental cost and your private fleet's going to get about 22 grand. So awards to date. We've, uh, we're incentivizing the purchase of class two through eight OEM, CNG, CNG biofuel electric and propane vehicles. CDOT has allocated $7 million uh, to us. To date, we have allocated $4.5 million in awards. 253 vehicles have been funded and awarded for 26 fleets. We're investigating funding transit vehicles with CDOT, but uh, as we all know within our world, it's complicated. Chaley could probably speak to that. that I'm joking, Chaley. <laughs> but uh, so these funds are federal highway DOT funds. If we want to go to transit, we have to flex these over to FTA. And then there's an additional little hiccup here, because this is done very commonly. But the issue becomes that FTA is never contracted with the RAC. And then the issue is what happens if this transit agency doesn't spend the money and they have to send the money back to RAC within this project. And that has never been done before. So there are some issues that we are trying to figure out within this project. Or simply, we could switch out some CMAC funds for some state funds, and that makes everything easy, easier. <laughs> so I wanted to show everybody vehicles by fuel and class. You can see the vast majority have been dedicated CNG vehicles. So 66%, that green area, are dedicated CNG. We've got about 7% on light duty CNG by fuel, and then we've got some medium and heavy duty propane within that area. So the vehicles by type have been all over the board, school buses, refuse trucks, tractors, delivery trucks. But again, the vast majority, heavy duty CNG, and that supports the governor's initiative of pushing CNG through the energy office's infrastructure that they've put out there. So I wanted to show everybody the county of operations. I knew that would be of interest to this group. So 21% of the vehicles in Weld, 38% of the vehicles in Adams County. That makes sense. Weld is where the infrastructure is at. Adams County is where the transportation hub is at. And then we've had our Denver, Boulder, Arapahoe, El Paso, and Larimer come in as well. So CO Alt Fuels Colorado program, again, I'm speaking for Wes. Uh, over half the existing sta stations in the state were along the Front Range when we started this project, many within the Denver metro area. So one of the things that we're trying to do is put out 20 to 30 new CNG stations in key locations around the state. The goal is, of course, as with electric vehicles, overcome the range anxiety uh, to get these vehicles to be adopted. CO is offering 80% of the equipment cost, capped at 500000 per station, and adding the 50000 uh, for co-location of EV or propane as well. So to date, CO has spent $7.5 million on 15 stations within the first 1.5 years. It's about 4.5 million GGE uh, sales projected for these stations. The next funding round will open up in January 2016, and the station rounds come about every six months. So they do it every two, two, two times a year. The RAC will accept application three times a year for both Charge Ahead and Alt Fuels Colorado. 
So here on this small map, <laughs> uh, you can see the, uh, the development around the state. The stars are what have been funded. The co-located electric charging and, and propane have been at Fort Collins, Loveland, and Greeley. And these, I believe, are Ward Energy Stations. So one other project that's near and dear to my heart, uh, we don't, I'm not sure who all knows about this project within this room, but we've run our Clean Air Fleets program since 2002. We've allocated about $5.2 million in EPA and CMAQ funds uh, to the older diesel vehicle retrofits in the area. So what we go out and do is work with school districts, we retrofit the buses with tailpipe equipment, idle reduction equipment. We can put telematics equipment on that, which is GPS and all the uh, AVL automatic vehicle location equipment. So we can see what that vehicle's doing, we can then manage its idle, and then you can do different things with route optimization and that sort of thing. So that's been a huge project. Uh, school buses, trash trucks, delivery vehicles, you name it. Most of it's, th this, that 5.2 is all public and all Denver area. So I wanted to show, again, the Denver metro area funded organizations for this project. Dozens of private companies are in there, but they're not in that $5.2 million. So with that, provided my contact information and Wes Mauer's uh, contact as well. Again, he isn't here to answer questions. So do I have time for questions, Jennifer or Steve? Yes. Great. Oh, I'm sorry, Elise. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we have a few minutes for questions. Um, questions from the board? I, well, I'd, I, then I, I have one. Um, we, Boulder County, in partnership with Adams County, Denver, CU, school districts, and a number of towns in Boulder County, just launched this very exciting uh, initiative of doing pooled purchase of electric vehicles, where we got um, a significant markdown um, on Nissan Leafs for anyone in the front range, if you're interested. Um, and. It's been, this has been in the last month, the program has been wildly successful. Several hundred leaves have been sold and another 300 are in process of being sold. And in addition to showing the, the power of partnership, it showed the incredible consumer demand that's out there for electric vehicles. And in talking with the dealerships that are offering this, um, Again, as we would suspect, the limiting factor is the fact that we don't have fast charging stations located on our major thoroughfares like I-25, I-70 in the metro area. And in, in looking at this program, I guess I would love to hear your thoughts on it feels like it's serving natural gas vehicles and stations fairly well, but it's not quite working for... EVs as successfully, and that was one of the, the hopes of the Dr. Cog board when this got approved, is that it'd be a fuel neutral enterprise that could help, help us achieve air quality on both fronts. So your thoughts on how we might be more successful, and I, and I look at the West Coast success in their creating the electric highway up and down I-5 and partnering with retail establishments to put in fast charging stations it seems to be working really well. Is there an opportunity for us to do something similar here? I, I can speak to the RACS program, but I won't, I won't speak to CEO's program, which is probably part of the issue. Uh, within the RAC area, we are offering $16,000 against that level three charger. The research we've done is twenty to $25,000 is what that unit's gonna cost. So again, we can only pay 80% of the cost. When we look at that cost, if it's 20 grand, that's what CMAQ will allow us to pay. So there are a number of different factors, and I think you've got some speakers here that can come up and talk to the different economics of uh, level three charging. But it's not cheap to run. You have to have a large amount of demand, I believe, to make that business model work, and we don't have a lot of vehicles on the road. So I guess one of the things I would throw out to this group is, one, getting the vehicles on the road, send us applications for vehicles from local governments, and that'd be great, and the state as well. We can fund those vehicles. And then I think, helping us get the word out on the tax incentives at the state and federal level on that $13,500 uh, tax incentive to get the vehicles out there. What we've heard from different stakeholders is they want to see the vehicles before they're going to put the money in for the, for the more expensive chargers. And another big 
part of our program is workplace charging. So the research we've done is you charge at home and you charge at work. Those chargers that are out, that we're putting out there, are fail-safe sort of emergency chargers. That's the way we're kind of seeing them to address range anxiety. So level three has its place. I don't know what the extensiveness of that network needs to be, and we have not heard what that needs to be. So we've looked at a number of different programs. Idaho National Laboratories has a ton of great research out there. The last thing I want to do with your money is put a stranded asset out there that costs $50,000 that is not going to get used. So we need your help and we need stakeholders help to get that message out there. Sorry, my mic was off. Other questions from board members? Comments? Um, could I see, uh, several people made it known to me that they wanted to speak in public comment on this particular topic. Could I see a show of hands of who intended to do that? Okay, um, it seems like it would be appropriate to hear from you all now before it, if board members are okay with that. And there's no more questions for Steve. Um, I would invite then those, those folks to come up one at a time. We have up to three minutes. Um, I'll ask you to be succinct because we do have the CDOT director waiting to go home to his newborn. Um, he's, not even, he's not even listening to my joke, but <laughs> he's obviously not in a hurry, so talk as long as you want. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Elise, and thank you to the board for the time. <laughs> yeah. All right, so well, I think we have four people that want to speak in public comment on the all-fuel vehicle program, and then, then we'll get to you. Hi, Will Tour with the Southwest Energy Efficiency Project. Great to see so many old friends here tonight. And, you know, first I just want to really encourage you to really take the alternative fuels work of the RAC and CO very seriously. I know it's a little bit out of the wheelhouse that the Dr. Cog Board is usually wrestling with in terms of, you know, roads and transit and bike ped infrastructure. But I think alternative fuels are going to be key to the metro area being able to meet the ozone standard. We all know that we're already having issues with the 75 ppb standard and with the standard moving to 70 ppb. Moving to much cleaner vehicles is going to be a really important strategy. Um, motor vehicles account for about 25 percent of the ozone precursors in the metro area depending on which inventory uh, you use. And we did some analysis looking both today and in 2020 after the metro area fleet of electric generating stations gets much cleaner than, than it has been, at what the impacts would be. And for each electric vehicle replacing a gasoline vehicle, we'll see about a 99.5% reduction in emissions of volatile organic compounds and about a 70% reduction in, in emissions of NOx, the two major ozone precursors. So would really encourage Dr. Cog to, to think sort of very carefully about how to engage on electric vehicles. Three particular opportunities. I think building on the great work that RAC and CO are doing that could support efforts to use Alternative Fuel Colorado to really make sure that we can provide those electric vehicle corridors across the state. I think the program today works really well for the metro area. But when you go out and you talk to customers, they also really want to know that they can get to other places in the state for those occasional trips that they take. The state of Oregon has really focused on that. And what they found was that actually was, in that case, very little in the way of financial incentives for individual purchase. They've been able to spur electric vehicle sales at a rate about three times what we have in the state of Colorado. So I think really paying attention on that. I, I think really encouraging a solution to this problem of how we get electric, make Alternative Fuels Colorado work for transit vehicles. RTD has stepped up and is now, with their purchase of electric vehicles for the mall shuttle, one of the leading transit agencies in the country for be beginning to embrace electric transit vehicles. We should make sure that Alternative Fuels Colorado works for them. And finally, I at least mentioned the really exciting program between Adams County, Boulder County, and Denver. I think it would be great for Dr. Cog to take a look at, could you work with your local governments to help that happen in counties all across the metro area? Thank you very much. And I'll pass this around. Thank you, Mr. Tour. 
Please come on up. Hi, good evening. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to speak. I appreciate it. Uh, my name is Nigel Zeed. I'm a, a leaf specialist at Boulder Nissan. Uh, I'm in Boulder. And um, firstly, if I may say, thank you very much for Dr. Cog, CEO, and RAC for helping support EV vehicles. In the last five weeks, we've sold uh, over 110 Leafs to residents in Boulder, Adams, and Denver counties. And in fact, Denver, count, Denver metro area is the hub of EV ownership in the state right now. By percentages, Douglas County and Boulder County have the highest percentage of registered EV per capita, but the whole metro area is leading EV adoption. Whilst most trips uh, in EVs are shorter trips around uh, the metro area, it is important for customers to know that they can travel across major corridors uh, in the state for occasional longer trips. This would require faster charging stations along, say, the I-25, the E-470, the I-70. And the current programs in the private sector uh, can provide stations in, in the metro area, but to get them along the long-distance corridors requires some additional support. As you know, the existing Alt, Alt uh, Fuels Colorado program allows grants of $50,000 for these fast charging stations, but only if they're co-located with a CNG station. I hope this doesn't sound cheeky, but uh, uh, although well-intentioned, it's not working so well in practice because a lot of the places where it's ideal for an EV station is not necessi necessarily ideal for a CND location as well. So ultimately, we're ending up with very little currently being installed. So if I may suggest, with a, a minor tweak, uh, if we could allow DC fast charging stations along highway corridors to be eligible for grants, but without the co-locating of the CNG, uh, I believe we'd get a long, a long way uh, to getting our major corridors electrified. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I have to say, everybody is lusting after your name tag. Uh, that is uh, sorry, I, really quite remarkable. Shameless. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you. Next. Um, hi, my name is Cameron McGregor. Um, I live in Littleton. I've lived on the Front Range for 20 years. For the last 15 months, I've been installing um, these very DC fast chargers on behalf of NRG EVGO. So um, this year we've installed 11 DC fast chargers without use of public money. Uh, ours is a purely private sector model and we've got four more uh, that we'll complete by the end of the year. These uh, stretch basically from Fort Collins to Colorado Springs. Um, and uh, I kind of came to talk about what, you know, what we're doing but what we're not doing. And um, there are some you know, significant challenges to installing these DC fast chargers. And so I kind of wanted to enlighten people on what some of the specific challenges are so you know what you need to achieve to, you know, create coverage for the whole state. But, you know, with a DC fast charger, you're typically speaking about three-phase commercial power. Um, they're a game changer for EV adoption because they really alleviate that anxiety at the dealership. That's the most important role for DC fast charging. The majority of charging should happen at level two locations like home and work. But that critical time when you come to work and the doctor calls or the school calls and your kid is sick, you need to have that EV fast charging. So it takes all kinds. I'm actually here to try to encourage more competition. Um, EVGO is launching 50 markets right now. We can't provide the type of coverage that the entire state of Colorado truly needs. And so I brought some notes. I wanted to talk about what some of the actual costs of DC fast charger deployment are. Um, that fast charger may be $25,000, but without a service plan, it's going to be like the marketplace at Sintera, where the plug share comments say, what's the point of a charging network if it's not maintained? And that does more harm than nothing at all. And so I want to encourage everyone to look at 10 years of maintenance costs, um, budgeting that in, lighting, security. You're looking at investments over $100,000 over 10 years to support these. And so I just think that the, the funding levels... Um, really should reflect that, uh, you know, if we, if we hope to achieve what I think are the goals of the program. Thanks. Thank you. I left some notes here. Pass, pass around. I think we had one or, one or two more. <laughs> you guys duke it out. <laughs> Art Griffith with Douglas County. Commissioner Partridge can't be here tonight, but on behalf of Douglas County, we are um, 
going along with the idea of encouraging implementing uh, the fast charging and I think the co-location is very problematic so we'd ask your consideration to maybe remove that co-relocation that would encourage us opportunities in retail areas and elsewhere so thank you thank you good evening I'm Jim Burness I'm the CEO of National Car Charging we're one of the largest distributors of electric charging equipment in the country and our offices are right down in Calamus so glad to be uh, raised here in, in Denver uh, as a company. Uh, I also would encourage uh, divorcing the, uh, the um, CNG and EV co-location requirement. Um, one of the issues we see all over the country is lumping all fuels together as essentially not gasoline, but the needs are actually very different. Uh, the ideal EV fast charge uh, location is right off the highway, has a place where you can uh, maybe buy a snack, clean restrooms, check your email, uh, and so uh, that really doesn't describe a lot of the CNG stations that are further off the highway, don't have the amenities, and a lot of it has to do with the fact that owning and operating a DC fast charge station is not a viable business model today. The costs are way too high for the equipment, for the installation, for the demand charges that are put on, the, uh, on these units, because many of them are 50 kilowatts apiece, so you're talking about a $1,000 demand charge to excel uh, right off the bat before you charge one car. So uh, the, the ideal place would be something like a Starbucks right off of Arapahoe Road or Johnson's Corner. Uh, and so uh, I would strongly encourage divorcing the, uh, the CNG and the EV location requirements. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Last call for anybody wanting to speak from the public on this particular topic. Oh, Steve. Please, can I say, I just want to clarify one thing. These, these, uh, CNG, the CNG infrastructure and the co-location, that's all on highway. That's not off highway. It is on a highway. It is uh, uh, the Flying Jays. It's like a Conoco gas station model. So just wanted to clarify that for the group. These aren't hidden, and they're not behind the fence operations. So, Great. Thanks for that clarification. Um, so just returning to the board briefly, um, this isn't an action item, but there has been some discussion on whether or not we want to give direction to staff to further investigate this issue. Several of our speakers had indicated that there might be things that we want to take a look at. Just want to check the pulse of the board before we move on. I see Robin. and I don't know if I can clarify. So they're, they're on highway, but they are required to co-locate. But I just want to clarify that that's an accurate statement, that they, yes. the requirement is for co-location. I mean, it does seem like we've heard a lot of feedback about the potential of separating it. So it seems like that would be worth but exploring. Just to clarify, on the Charge Ahead Colorado side, there is not a requirement for co-location. That is an electric vehicle program, more attuned to that. All Fuels Colorado. Okay, great. Suzanne? Well, I think it would be interesting to understand from staff how we might, if there are tweaks that would make um, electric vehicle purchasing. I mean, this partnership is a really interesting, exciting thing. Um, so whether it, there are policies that can support that kind of creative um, launching of more EVs, um, as well as whether there's tweaks to the program around charging that we should be looking into. Um, it seems like it's in everybody's best interest to make this successful, especially before we have this ozone conversation. Any other comments from board members on this? Commissioner? I mean, it appears that this is a, 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 a difficult uh, issue to address in the sense that uh, the, the market uh, for the selling of EV vehicles uh, is really dependent upon the willingness of, of both the private and public sector to provide opportunities for their uh, recharging. So uh, the focus should be for our uh, staff to look at that aspect and, and do some uh, cost analysis as to how we can uh, effectively through either uh, federal, state, or, or local governments uh, to provide uh, encouragements or in, and or incentives to uh, to allow that uh, proliferation to happen. 
Thank you for that. So in the interest of time, it sounds like there's some interest in exploring some of the uh, items that were brought up by members of the public and and Steve on this. I think it, I would summarize looking at the opportunities to to tweak the program to maximize its effectiveness, in particular the whether or not co-location is, is working, whether or not there's an opportunity to um, swap out funds to make the, the transit bus piece work. There might be other items, but those are two that really leapt to the forefront, I think. Jennifer? We will certainly go back. We, we've actually been on the phone, or I've not, but other staff have been on the phone for the last couple of days trying to work through some of these issues. We will uh, continue to collect information and bring it back uh, to you. I'm not sure, at this point at least, how much of what we bring back is the uh, Dr. Cog staff position on these things, but rather the assessment from the, the energy office, the RAC, uh, CDOT, and others, because we're kind of a, while, while this was CMAC money and would, I'm pretty sure, would have come to the region, um, I'm not really sure how much of, we're just not that close to these things, so we're not the experts on this, so we're going to be relying on our, on our partners out there to help us pull this information together and bring it back to you. And so we may even drag them along with us when we come back uh, with, with some, some additional information for you. Okay. And we should look for this next meeting, November, December? We, uh, we will definitely shoot for that. I, I, okay. I, again, we're going to be reliant upon some staff from other uh, organizations to help us pull this together. Great. Okay. Um, I would be hesitant to have this re re this be a requirement to come back next meeting. If you're having difficulty trying to pull things together, I would rather have a full briefing and it may come back first part of next year instead of trying to rush putting something ahead of other items that we have for, no, for next month. So I'd rather have a full good presentation instead of, you know, I know you guys are working as hard as you can but I, I would really be hesitant to say bring it back next meeting. Yeah, I was asking, but um, point well taken when you can. So we have been keeping the CDOT director waiting long enough, and uh, I know you have things to do at home. So I think you're giving us a teaser on the uh, transportation summit for, for next week, and we very much appreciate you taking the time to be with us. So I apologize for the folks that I have my back to. Um, so at least I like you, and uh, and and notwithstanding the fact that every time we are together, you are pleasantly and persistently pushing me for for something. And I want you to know that when I was caught not listening to your joke <laughs> earlier, that whatever lizard brain thing that is in every husband's brain, that when your wife starts talking and you're not paying attention. And it clicks on that sort of recorder that and, and an alarm wells up inside of you. I was actually tearing myself away from that conversation to zone in on your point because that alarm bell was going off. And I want you to know, I've developed that with you over the last eight months, and I think that's good. I'm not sure it is, but all right. <laughs> so that's what I was like. I, I heard the three minutes per person part. Uh, so thank you very much and uh, no need to worry about the uh, keeping me waiting there. I think one, it's an important conversation and I want to say, and I, I checked with uh, 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 a couple of folks, I, I feel like I feel like somewhere I've had this uh, conversation with someone at CDOT where by between CDOT and uh, Utah DOT talking about um, making I-70 a, uh, an electrified corridor so that folks can drive along uh, and it's not just in Colorado but don't quote me on that because it may just be me um, channeling that stuff uh, and two story time at the Denver Public Library started at 7 so I'm I'm in trouble for that regardless I can stay as long as I need to so uh, in the interest of time I do want to come and I thank you for uh, uh, hearing us out on this um, you know there, uh, you know, I got a couple of emails tonight on my way down here, uh, or before I, I was on my way down here, talking about two, a head-on collision between two semis on uh, US 287, and uh, you know, we get we get crash information. I get emails like that all the time, and it's a very clinical email 
that comes in, right? It's a clinical email that will say uh, US-287 mile marker X or uh, U uh, uh, I-70 mile marker 208 crash. Uh, and then the next part is the part you're always looking for, which is, uh, you know, is uh, uh, what sort of emergency services are requested, fatality. Uh, and it's a very clinical email, which says nothing for the impact that that actual event has on lots of people. And we know that we've lost uh, close to 500 people over the years on Colorado roadways, right? That doesn't count the nearly 3,000 serious injuries that we have. And all of those fatalities and injuries have ripple effects, right? So if it's a, if it's a husband or, or mother who can't go to work, that family is impacted. There's an emotional toll. Um, and so when we come next week and we launch this Rodex program, to me, that, that, that person, and we don't know who those 500 people are, right? On January 1st of that year, nobody knows who those 483 people will be, right? And so we're not going to be able to say that, you know, here's the person that wasn't in that crash, but our primary goal around Rodex is safety, right? Uh, and it's not just sort of... Um, hearsay that's around that. I mean, I, I chair the national uh, V to I, Vehicle to Infrastructure Deployment Coalition, right? So just like on the electric charging stations, we're trying to get this uh, connected vehicle, vehicle to infrastructure, uh, the infrastructure deployed nationally, because we've been talking about this for a long time. We've actually been asking Congress to uh, hold a certain uh, spectrum of the broadband for us. And of course, there's private sector who's like, we want that. We want that. We want that. I'm telling people we got to go. We got to. We got to move. Um, you know. And uh, but what did happen on my way down here is I I pulled up to a light. Uh, anybody remember the Seinfeld episode where he talked about the the sort of the look away game, right? When you see somebody beside you and then you look away and stuff. Well, I pulled up to this intersection and there was this, you know, uh, uh, lady in the car beside me, and so I looked over at her and, as has uh, been most of the case, she didn't have very much interest in looking back over, right? But generally in my life what has happened is that lady would look over and then quickly look away, right? This lady didn't even look. Didn't even look. You know why? Because she was looking at her phone. She was looking at her phone, and when that light turned green and I pulled away, she sat there. And how many people have had that experience where you've been at a light and the person in front of you doesn't move or the car beside you? I mean, just let's just see. Has anybody not? Right, so everybody has had that experience. The other day, I was merging onto I-25, and uh, it was one of those two lanes that merge into one lane, and then you merge on. And the person in the car beside me was merging, looking down at their phone. And you know, there's been an uptick in uh, there's been an uptick in fatalities. I mean, many of you, I'm sure, are aware of the fact that you know fatalities were declining for a few years, and now they're coming back up. Well, VMT has gone back up a little bit, but I would say that a lot of it has to do with distracted driving. So with, uh, with Rodex, what we're going to do is, you know, we're trying to come up with a mission statement for it, right? A mission and a vision, and we were getting a little uh, safety Lewis, right? So a little, um, you know, uh, safe, multimodal, interoperable system to help reduce uh, fatalities and congestion. And what I asked them to do is cut that down and just say the mission of Rodex is to say zero fatalities and zero congestion and therefore zero injuries on our roadways. Now that's the goal, right? Uh, it's a pretty lofty goal. And even the Federal Highway Administration only estimates that 80% of crashes can be eliminated through these connected vehicle uh, technologies. But I think if you set a goal and a vision of saying, we don't have any crashes, we don't want to have any congestion, and as a corollary to that, maybe we can help, uh, I don't know if we can get to zero pollution. That's a, more of a Volkswagen answer. But I think that we can, uh, is that too soon? Not for the EV guys, you know, that's right. Uh, so, uh, but I think that is the vision. So how are we going to do that? And what are we going to talk about next week? And what are we going to do? So Secretary Fox is coming uh, to, uh, to help be our keynote. We actually have the CEO from Michigan, the state DOT CEO, Kirk Steidel, who's been a leader in this field for, uh, for about 10 years, working with, the, uh, um, with the, uh, the big auto firms who are trying to take technology and put it in their cars. And then we also actually have the CEO from Caltrans, the California DOT, who's going to come because in California they have all the technology companies who are trying to put four wheels on their, uh, uh, on their technology. And it's an unknown battle as to, as to what's going to happen. But um, 
Uh, we actually have uh, BMW now, so we, we, we had Volvo lined up, and now uh, they, for whatever reason, couldn't could make it happen. So BMW is going to bring uh, their a couple of their uh, uh, cars, uh, autonomous cars. We're going to give some people some rides. Uh, we're actually going out to the public uh, uh, to do like some raffles, and they're going to get a ride in an autonomous vehicle on US 36. Uh, and this is either going to go really well and launch autonomous vehicles, <laughs> or people are like, whatever happened to that bald executive director of uh, of CDOT that we had? Uh, but we want people to know that it's here. I mean, uh, Tesla is is if you have if you have a newer model Tesla, uh, they will they have a software patch now that uh, they will download overnight and your car. In fact, a buddy of mine was saying that you know he's been driving to work without an, with, without his hands on the steering wheel, uh, you know. Which of course you get that. Uh, I would say that you know uh, you know for my buddy in particular that's actually a good thing. Uh, <laughs> You know, because he's a terrible driver, and like most bad drivers, he thinks he's an awesome driver. Um, and we know that the vast majority of crashes are caused by human error. So, what Rodex is is uh, is an attempt by the state to say, look, we know this technology is out there. We know the private sector uh, is very nimble and 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 providing a lot of great solutions. So, what we want to say is that the state of Colorado is open for business with regard to providing a safe ecosystem so that these companies can come and deploy this technology. Now, I'll tell you, it is going to, we face about a messy 15 years of having these Teslas and BMWs and, and other high-end cars and it migrating down through the ranks, interacting that, that are smart cars or connected vehicles, interacting with the folks who want to keep their 2001 Honda Civic because for whatever reason it's still running. And we're going to have to figure out a way that these two, um, these two uh, different groups of vehicles, how they interact on the road. Uh, but we need we need to start, uh, you know, dealing with this, both from a safety perspective and also from a congestion perspective. Uh, you know, I mean, most of our congestion, uh, or a lot of our congestion, is caused by incidents. Uh, you know, rubbernecking, folks stopping to look, crashes, end of queue crashes. And so we need to look at that. So there's a lot of companies that are coming. Uh, Peloton is a company that's coming. They do truck platooning. When we called them and said, hey, we want to bring you out here, they said, Colorado wasn't even on our radar, but we'll hap we're happy to come out. Um, there's a company called Here, which is a Nokia spinoff. They have done a deployment in Helsinki around phones. So not everybody's going to have a connected vehicle in the next few years, but everybody's going to have a phone. So uh, Nokia and Here have done this uh, pilot in uh, Helsinki. They're looking to do a, a, a U.S. pilot. We'd love to have a conversation with them doing it here. And we know that uh, particularly around the congestion issues, Dr. Cog uh, and City and, and County of Denver are going to play a huge role. So Jennifer and I have had some conversations about this. We want you all to be partners. We want you all to be uh, players if you have ideas. And again, remembering that the vision for this is zero crashes, zero injuries, and zero congestion. And we know we're, we're not going to be able to do that soon, but that is where I would see uh, uh, technology being able to take us uh, in a few years. And I don't discount the security issues. Uh, the security issues are real. There's something we're going to have to deal with. But, you know, today I read that uh, CIA Director Brennan's uh, emails are going to be released by WikiLeaks. If they can get the, uh, the, 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 the CIA Director's emails, right, then I feel like all of us and all of society has to take a look at technology and understand how we ratchet up our, our game on safety. And how many of you heard about the Jeep that was hacked? Right? So the Jeep was hacked and somebody took control and, and, and was able to do bad things. But that was not a connected vehicle in the sense of an autonomous vehicle or a connected vehicle. That is just a standard Jeep with a, with a GPS system now and, and the, the sort of the Bluetooth. Uh, t so, so many vehicles now are hackable. And that is a completely different problem set than, than connected vehicles or autonomous vehicles. So with that happy thought, uh, <laughs> And, and, and visions of safety in your head. I'm happy to stop there, take questions. My staff asked me to keep it at a high level so we don't jump the gun for next week, but we look forward to you folks coming out, uh, those of you who can, next week. Just, I'm curious, how many people are planning on going to the Transportation Summit? So we're definitely looking forward to it. And I just want to go on record as saying that the US 36 is our, uh, my corridor, and I really hope you don't die in it, because that would bum me out. Just one. Thank you. Yeah, just you know, I you you were you were, you know, feeling warm, alarm warm bells it. go off, and I just wanted to you know show you a little U.S. 36 love there, Commissioner Holan. I think you wanted to say something. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, 
We, I'm a, uh, I serve on the National Board of uh, NACO Transportation Board, and we've been tracking the, uh, the MAP 21 debacle going on in Congress. And it's my understanding that um, the House has reached an agreement uh, and will be marking up a bill mm -hmm. uh, not sim not dis uh, somewhat dissimilar from the Senate version that will provide us a three-year funding uh, opportunity and uh, of course it still needs to be appropriated so can you comment briefly on where we are with that and and uh, its its impact and, and the other kind of closing comment is that that uh, it's great to have autonomous vehicles but if we can't get them out of the potholes it's going to be an issue that is a that is a that is a true statement uh, so on, on the federal side I think that um, it's kind of the same place we've been for the last you know, since 2008, whenever Safety Lou expired, or 2006, uh, when Safety Lou expired, we're sort of hoping for, and even MAP 21 was a, was a two-year bill. This is a six-year bill that they're talking about with three years of funding and paid for with what I would call gimmicks, and Mickey's back here, but I, you know, I mean, the last time they talked about pension smoothing, right, which is just, I'd like to be able to go home and say, we're going to smooth our, our expenses, right? Uh, but... Uh, um, it, the bottom line is is that I don't see very much uh, difference. It, it's it's just safety loop plus inflation, and that that translates to Colorado's standard you know 560 million dollars that we generally get, and that will not address our billion dollar a year shortfall that Colorado has. Uh, and uh, and and it's because of that billion dollar a year shortfall that we have things like these potholes that are that are that are out there. So I guess. Uh, uh, depressing status quo is the DC version, and 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 while there is some similarity between the House and the Senate bill, I think the pay fors are not, you know, are not easy, and you can't elect a Speaker of the House right now. How are you going to uh, get um, get a transportation bill out and the debt ceiling? So anyway, there's a lot of other stuff, and I will not. Uh, I'll stop there. I think we have time for just a couple more questions or comments, Herb. Well, Shailen, thanks for using 36 for a guinea pig, but uh, <laughs> I think almost every municipality in the county that's along US 36 is here tonight, so please let us know what time so we can warn the citizens that you're coming. <laughs> that, I'm, that I'm what? Driving this remote car. Oh, yes, yes. Um, and, and um, you know, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll be in one, I think. <laughs> All right, well, let us thank you again for coming and sharing some time with us. We really appreciate how often we get to see you, and um, we look forward to the summit next week. And, and thank you for your warm thoughts of me not becoming a statistic on one of my own roads. <laughs> Take care. All right, um, moving along, we are now at the report of the chair, and that is me tonight. Um, so I just wanted to talk briefly about a couple of things. One is I, I think uh, Jackie had mentioned that we, several of us were going to D.C. on a lobby trip around transportation and aging issues. Jackie, myself, uh, went with uh, Jayla and Doug from the staff, and we were accompanied, of course, by um, Mickey Farrell, our uh, very excellent federal lobbyist. Um, and our, we are focusing on two major issues, one, the reauthorization of the Older Americans Act and how the funding formula formula penalizes fa fast growing states like Colorado and then also of course the federal transportation reauthorization and our desire for a long term fully funded bill. Um, we met directly with uh, representatives Polis, Perlmutter and Senator Gardner and then also staff with uh, Fur Kaufman, uh, Buck, Senator Bennett, DeGette and uh, one administration official and um, the National Association of AAAs so really uh, wore out some shoe leather, it was, it was a useful visit, but as Shailen Bott, uh, Director Bott had alluded, things are a little bit in disarray in Congress right now, and we were back right when things were very much up in arms with the House leadership decision. So um, I wouldn't hold your breath on both, either one of those bills moving through, but at least our delegation is very well briefed on the issues that we have around the funding formulas in both of those bills. So I think that was time well spent. Two, we had a great dinner with the Transportation Commissioners last Wednesday. Um, 
really good discussion around the importance of, of transportation funding, our desire to work more closely with, the, with CDOT and the commissioners. We also talked about some of the state legislation that's likely to be popping up, both around um, funding issues and also the, the number of transportation commissioners is likely a bill we'll be seeing. So um, really robust discussion. And I would say the only thing that was a little disappointing is that more people weren't there. And I really want to encourage Dr. Cog members to think about the opportunity when we have uh, events like that, if, to have one-on-one -on -one time with the Transportation Commission and Director Bott, really, really beneficial both to Dr. Cog and to your jurisdictions as we work to build relationships. So encourage people to take advantage of, of events like that when they come up. Um, I want to report on the RTC meeting on Tuesday. Basically, they went through most of the things that we're going through tonight and unanimously approved them, specifically the 2015 Cycle 2 amendments to the RTP for the purposes of air quality modeling, and then the stationary master plans, urban center studies, and the TDM projects, all approved with relatively little discussion. So that went well. And then last but not least, um, the Structure and Governance Committee continues to do really good work. We had a meeting October 7th where we discussed dues, and uh, the, it was the sense of the committee that it was um, that the, the current formula, which includes population and valuation, was the proper formula. And while it's up to the administration, administrative committee to, to make a decision, um, a recommendation of the full board that it's time to unfreeze the dues. And indeed, the um, admin committee just made that recommendation of the board in the meeting that just preceded this one. Um, the other thing that the Structure and Governance Committee is working hard on that you all should be aware of is turning um, MVIC into a study session rather than a standalone committee, um, really looking at whether or not that would help uh, with um, board participation and, and prevent the, the sort of back and forth between MVIC and the full board when we deal with tough issues. Um, if that change is to come about, um, probably we would be in the spring of the new year when board officers change to give us sort of time to, to make that switch. And uh, the, the other thing, the issues that we're still taking a look at would be the waiting voted issue and how cities and counties would be treated in that and to look at onboarding issues with new board members and also the structure and role of the admin committee and the executive committee. So that's still work that, that's to come and we have another meeting coming up in a few weeks. I think the last thing I'll say is that we have a Dr. Cog open house that's coming up December 16th. Put it on your calendar now. It is a really unique and wonderful opportunity. We go upstairs and we walk around and we see what staff actually do and look at all of the cool programs and um, tools that they have. And it's, it's just extremely informational and, and good bonding with the staff as well. So it would be great if everybody could make a point of making that this year. And then I'll turn it over to Jennifer. That we also had an aging summit at Dr. Cog that I was unable to attend. That was really important as well. Okay. Well, I will start with that then. Um, uh, we, last week we held a um, um, a leadership and aging summit, and it was really targeting and reaching out to the Colorado congressional delegation. But we also had members of the General Assembly there. We had caregivers and healthcare professionals, consumers. Uh, anyone who was interested in aging there. In fact, we had an audience so big that we couldn't hold it here, Dr. Cog. We had uh, 100 people that attended, and we moved it to a hotel downstairs or downtown. But um, uh, the the real focus of the summit was to make sure that the um, uh, the advocates for seniors and the con Colorado congressional delegation understands the problems with the current Older Americans Act, as well as the uh, reauthorization that the Senate passed out. They both are, are very problematic for Colorado. Um, one of the, the great things that happened in the meeting was um, uh, the representative from uh, Mr. Kaufman's office pointed out that uh, the Colorado uh, representation in the House, there were only seven, and there was only so much that they could do. Um, and uh, we continued that discussion about the cost to Colorado if uh, seniors are pushed prematurely into uh, assisted living facilities and nursing homes. 
And um, uh, by the end of the next day, we actually had a request from uh, the representative's office asking for a letter that he could sign and request his um, uh, peers in the House to uh, uh, fix uh, the problems in the uh, Older Americans Act as they take it up. Um, uh, probably not this year. I don't have a whole lot of hope, like Shailen was saying. It's a lot of disarray in the House right now, but um, when they do take it up, that they um, fix the problems that are in the, uh, in the Older Americans Act and that will assure that Colorado's older adults receive their fair share of the federal funding. Um, we have a unique opportunity, perhaps, that's presenting itself to us. This actually came to us through Elise uh, and a contact that she made um, several months ago. The university, or excuse me, the Portland State University has contacted us about the possibility of us participating in a peer-to-peer -peer, um, uh, process next spring to talk about how to do better transportation investment decision making. This follows on the heels, as you know, of us working on the TIP, uh, having a bit of a debrief here, forming a committee to talk about, you know, what might be different going forward uh, for future boards. So uh, this would be working with other MPOs, maybe even a DOT, uh, to talk about how we do this better, how you measure performance, um, how you uh, have good public involvement, all those sorts of things. But whatever we decide would be um, what we want to talk about is what the group would work on. Um, this, um, uh, the uh, Portland uh, State University would make available to us subject matter experts who would come here and work with us. Uh, we would work with our peers uh, as a group together from time to time. Uh, the cost of Dr. Cog would be about $50,000, which would pay for the travel for the subject matter experts and the staff at Portland State. Uh, to come here or wherever the groups were meeting um, to see if this is a good fit for us or something that we're really interested in. We are going to um, have staff from uh, the university here the first week of December. We will schedule it around the, uh, he'll be here for two days. Uh, we'll schedule this around the MVIC meeting. Uh, we'll schedule time so that if you can't make one day in the morning, maybe you can make the next day in the afternoon. would invite your staff to come and participate as well. We really want to hear from you what you think the problems that we've encountered are uh, and how we could make the process better. And then once all those discussions have, uh, have occurred, we'll decide whether or not this is something that we'd like to participate in with our peers and the university. Um, the uh, Dr. Cog has uh, purchased a subscription through um, Efficient Gov. I don't know how many of you may be familiar with Efficient Gov, but um, uh, they are um, an information services that tracks innovative solutions for um, fiscal and operational challenges that local governments and organizations like Dr. Cog run into. They have a, uh, an app called Grant Finder. And uh, it provides access to more than 4,000 federal, state, corporate, and foundation grants. And uh, for really, a, a, we think, a bargain price of $2,000, actually a little bit less than $2,000, Dr. Cog got 50 seats to go out and search this. So um, that's not quite enough as um, that's, that number is not quite a, the same as our membership number, but we still think because we don't have um, all 56 members of Dr. Cog as active members, not everyone will necessarily want uh, to participate in this, but uh, we'll send you some more information about this. This is a great opportunity uh, to search this database to look for um, uh, funding that you might not otherwise be aware of to do programs in your community. And Flo Rotano is the current um, uh, contact person on that, but we will, like I said, we'll, we'll send out some emails. We'll be sure to reach out to your staff and make sure that those of you who want to participate in the program uh, can. And if, if for some reason we don't have enough seats, uh, Dr. Cog actually has seats um, uh, as well, so we can, we can do searches for you if, if you don't get one of your own. And I think... Oh, uh, one more thing I wanted to mention was um, we have, you have heard uh, from uh, both Jayla and I, and some of you have heard more than others, um, that we are 
really changing how we do business in the AAA. Uh, we have an opportunity to uh, really branch out and use the, the, the expertise that we've garnered over the last 40 years um, uh, to reach more seniors uh, in the region. And what this, uh, this has really been brought about by the changes that uh, accompany the Affordable Care Act. For example, hospitals are being held accountable for uh, readmissions. They actually get fined uh, when people are readmitted to the hospital within 30 days. Uh, this is an area of expertise that Dr. Cog has developed over the years. We have been very successful in keeping seniors uh, from readmitting to hospitals. In fact, a uh, program that we um, uh, participated in with some federal grant money um, just a few months ago, we were well below the national average for readmissions and we saved uh, an estimated um, uh, seven or eight million dollars in Medicare funding by helping people stay out of hospitals. So we actually have hospitals now reaching out to us and saying, will you come run your program at our hospital? So um, we've been trying to figure out how do we improve our business acumen uh, within the AAA. This is a, a working with the private sector in this kind of way is, is different than what we've done in the past. So uh, we applied and received a grant from the Colorado Health Foundation in the amount of $50,000 to train three of our staff on how to contract with, yeah, oh, I'm sorry? Four. Four of our staff. Oh, sorry. Four of our staff, not three of our staff, trained four of our staff um, in uh, contracting with the healthcare industry. So that'll start taking place actually um, this month and then there's more training that comes up in the spring. So uh, we're really happy that, to have this opportunity and it allows us to um, uh, continue to investigate working in this area uh, as we go forward. So I think that's it unless there are questions. Any questions for Jennifer? All right, I, I, I made a big promise, so I'm going to keep us moving along. Um, we're back to public comment for those of you um, who wanted to speak on something other than the Alt Fuels Project. Do we have any takers? All right, seeing no one, we'll move on to um, our consent agenda, which consists of our minutes. Got a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Passes unanimously. We're on to our uh, action agenda, I'm starting out with the... Uh, Second year project delays and appeals for TIP projects. So, Doug? Great. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and good evening to the board. Um, yeah, the, the item today is for second year delays. Um, within the Dr. Cog TIP policy, um, there's a section that deals with project delays, and that's included in your packet as attachment one. Um, the, really, the purpose for that, for that policy is to expedite the expenditures of funds on, on projects so we can get those out to the public in, in a timely fashion. But in a nutshell, the, the Dr. Cog policy is a really a two-strike policy. Um, every project has established milestones that it must meet in order to not be delayed. So for example, a one-year construction project, in order for that not to be delayed, it has to go to add within the first year. And we use the federal fiscal year to, um, you know, f uh, to make that determination. So. Um, if the project is not going to add by the end of September, it, is a fr it gets a one strike, it's one year delayed. If that project in the second year is not able to go to add, it gets a second strike. Um, and, and as a result of that, it, ha it, faces the it faces the potential of losing its funding. Um, so. You know, the board will recall um, in February of this past year, um, we amended the, we, you, amended the TIP policy related to second year delays. Um, the amendment allows sponsors of projects of, that has uh, delayed phases um, to appeal to the board for a variance to continue their project. You might recall that the, the previous um, TIP policy we had with second year delays really didn't allow that opportunity for appeals. If you did not, um, if you, if you were unable or you received that second strike, then you would just, your project basically was terminated. You, you, you would lose the funding. Um, so, so really, you know, here we are. This is the purpose of the meeting tonight. Um, we have three projects, one from the city of Boulder, one from the city of Greenwood Village, or Greenwood Village, and one from the city of Thornton that are facing the second year delays. All three communities have expressed an interest 
um, in appealing to the board, which is illustrated in the correspondence we have received from them and is included in your packet in the letters that are in uh, as a, as a, attached as attachment two in your packet. Um, and upon, upon the proceedings today, the board really has two options based on our TIP policy with regards to second delays. The first is to deny the appeal. Um, the sponsor will, will not receive any reimbursements on federal payment requests after September 30th if the appeal is, is, is uh, denied. Um, the, the other option is to allow a variance. And if the board believes the good faith efforts and progress has been made by the sponsor to advance the delay project, um, the sponsor may be granted an extension up to 120 days from October 1st, which is January 28th of uh, 2016. Um, so, so that is really the two options that, are, that, that we have. Um, this is a new process for all of us. Uh, we've never really done this before. Um, so what I propose, Madam Chair, if it pleases the committee, what I thought I would do is just quickly walk through each of those projects and um, explain to you what needs to happen for those projects to, to be able to advance and um, give staff's recommendation. And, and then um, uh, we, we have staff from all three of those communities, I believe, here tonight. If not, I know we have board members from those, elect from, from, those, uh, from, from those communities that can provide additional comments or can answer any questions that you may have. Sounds good. Great. Thank you very much. Okay. The first project is um, in the city of Boulder. It's a baseline bike, bicycle pedestrian underpass project. Wow. That screen is really bad. <laughs> um, and it, it's, it's, it's a project on Baseline Road, for those who are familiar. Which one? That one? Uh, that's not it. Well, here, I'll go to this one. This is a little easier. So it's, it's a project that's east of Broadway on Baseline Road. It's an underpass pedestrian project. Um, and the project itself it will provide a uh, grade separated crossing from um, a baseline road east of Broadway so it's basically it's this connection right here if you can see is it'll be an underpass project right there um, it will have 10 foot wide multi-directional path connections to the sidewalks on either side the project will also construct a multi-purpose path and bicycle lanes on baseline um, in order for this project not to be delayed um, it has to go to add project Advertisement is anticipated for late December of this year after the IGA has been executed and right-of-way clearances have been obtained. Um, we, we've been in constant contact with staff on this as well as CDOT staff and we feel that it has progressed to, to the point that we feel comfortable making a recommendation of a variance of 120 days. The, uh, the next project is a Greenwood Village project, uh, Greenwood Plaza Boulevard sidewalks. Um, the project will construct new multi-use sidewalks at least eight feet wide to fill a, in uh, missing gaps in the network along the Greenwood Plaza uh, Boulevard, uh, in particular between Barry and Dorado or Dorado? Dorado Place and Marin Drive to Long, Long Avenue. Marin. What's Marin. that? Marin. Marin? Yeah. Oh, gee, I, knew, I, knew, I knew I should have checked this beforehand. Um, so in order for that project to not be delayed, that project must also go to add. Uh, Greenwood Village has one right-of-way acquisition remaining to obtain that right-of-way clearance. Um, the project is expected to advertise here real soon in November. And again, uh, staff's recommendation is to, uh, to, to grant the 120 variance. Uh, one thing I would add, this is centered on an RTD station to make uh, pedestrian bike better connections and uh, that's really key as to one of the reasons we went after this grant in the first place was to make uh, the last uh, quarter mile uh, connections much better. Great. Thank you, sir, very much. Um, and the last project for this evening is uh, City of Thornton project. Um, is actually, it's a second, it's a fast track second commitment project that uh, Thornton is the sponsor of. It's a North Metro Rail Bicycle Pedestrian um, access to fast track stations project. Gee whiz, that map is really bad. And, um, but in order for this project not to be delayed, the right of way phase must be initiated. In other words, the plans, the right of way plans have to be completed. Um, the, 
The right of way plans are anticipated to be completed towards the end of January. Um, so as you probably noticed, this is right up on that deadline of that 120 20 day variance. Um, we are certainly aware of that. I know Thornton staff is more than aware of that. Um, and we are going to work like dogs to get this thing done and, and work with CDOT in order to get those submitted in a timely fashion. So um, it is our recommendation as well that this project also um, um, uh, have the 120 day variance. Thank you, Doug. Are there any questions or need for clarification? I see Bob and then George and then Don. So I know it's a new process, so we'll we'll work through it. Um, <laughs> the one out of the three gave an explanation on why they're delayed, and um, I'd like to know why they're delayed after two years. Uh, Thornton, I think, describes it in their letter, but the other two did not. I mean, so for me to support any delay, I need to know why, not just an ask. Is that that is, doesn't enforce the process we're trying to put in place? It's basically giving an easy out to put four more months on it. So I need to know why they're they're delayed. So if I could have the queue wait up for a second, we'll have representatives from the projects answer that question. Well, and can we review them individually, not as a group? I think it's just smart that we assess each one individually on their own merits. And we not we can delayed. do this however we want. Okay. If, if that's the pleasure, we can do that. Okay. Um, I, so. But I want to make sure George and Don both wanted to speak. Do you want to hold that and wait for specific projects, or do you, do you have some general comments you'd like to make now? I think my question is probably fairly quick to answer. So if I, I'm fully supporting of what Bob wants to do, though, but um, my question is, what are the funds for each one of these projects that are in jeopardy? I mean, it looks like the the Boulder project said that there's five million dollars that it could be withdrawn from the project. What about the other two? Yeah. Well, it's um, the actual, well, on the Boulder project first, that it is a $5.4 million project of which the federal share of that is, which one? About, about $4 million, Todd tells me. Um, the, I'm sure you're doing this math as we go here, Todd. The, uh, the Greenwood Village project is a $1.6 million total funding, and the federal share on that is about 800000 Well, just in jeopardy. Oh, sorry. Yes, yeah, 676 is the phase that, uh, that is in jeopardy, $676,000. And um, the City of Thornton project is a $1.9 million project, and the funding that's in jeopardy is? is the $185,000. Great. Don? Thank you, Madam Chair. I have the same question as um, Councilman Teal did um, in regards to that, so thank you. Thank Great. So it sounds like the pleasure of the board is to go project by project. Why don't we go with the first project, Boulder, and, and um, either uh, yeah. it's the staff from Boulder want to give a brief explanation as to why this is held up. That would be great. My name is Garrett Slater. I'm the principal transportation engineer for the city of Boulder. So uh, I'd like to say I'm happy to be here with you tonight, but I'm not necessarily under these circumstances happy to be here with you tonight. But I'm happy to provide an explanation as to why we are where we are. So this project, uh, we got it underway in 2012 and worked diligently on the design development through the preliminary design and uh, worked in, in process with uh, all of our stakeholders. Uh, obviously, CU is a major stakeholder on this project along with CDOT. Um, as the project progressed through final design, we were preparing to get the project ready for construction and advertisement uh, about this time in 2014. And then we hit a roadblock uh, because Baseline, while it is a City of Boulder facility, it is also a CDOT facility because it uh, connects Highway 36 with Highway 93. It's uh, technically labeled on the National Highway System as uh, US 36E. And so therefore, CDOT has the ultimate purview of this facility. And so uh, as we were trying to work toward the uh, final advertisement of the, uh, the 
proposed construction project, CDOT took exception to some of the elements within the design. They had some concerns about how it would uh, change the operation of the facility. So we worked uh, very closely with them over the course of the past year to try to uh, reach resolution on uh, allowing them to uh, let the design proceed as proposed by the city staff. And uh, ultimately, we were not able to, uh, to come to a, what you might call a clean and simple uh, resolution. But what we uh, were able to get, uh, CDOT staff did allow us to move forward with uh, allowing the, the design to, um, to to, uh, to get uh, finalized, so we, what we do have is a full and complete ready to advertise package right now. Um, but um, the director for Region 4 did not, would not allow the project to move forward for advertisement until we had an IGA in place for the operation of that facility. Uh, where we la landed on that is that CDOT said, we'll allow you to move forward with your design uh, so long as you accept certain um, triggers, or they call them key performance indicators. And so we have to observe the, um, the operation of the facility three years post-construction. If certain thresholds are exceeded, then um, CDOT will require the city to take over the, the roadway, uh, and they will do a devolution of that section of, uh, of the, the system. Um, so we have reached agreement in principle. Um, CDOT is requiring an IGA between uh, them as well as the city. And so we uh, have reached agreement. We are working through getting this, the attorneys to sign that IGA. Um, like I said, the design documents are ready to go. So uh, pending the resolution of, of having the, the finished IGA, we'll be ready to, to go to advertisement. And we expect to have the IGA all signed and ready to go by the end of November and targeting an advertisement for construction in December. So happy to take any questions about the process. I see Herb's hand up, and then George's, and then Bob's. I, with any IGA, there's always this issue of the attorneys. <laughs> I uh, understood. She, she's one. She hit me already. <laughs> so the question uh, I have is, what if you don't get it signed? Uh, we have uh, worked with staff uh, or the, the attorneys from the city of Boulder um, and to explain the circumstances to them. They uh, have uh, indicated to us that so long as we are comfortable with the technical parameters, which we've reached that point in the IGA, that the general um, boilerplate language typical to an IGA won't be a problem. So they've uh, um, made us feel very comfortable that, that moving forward on our side won't be an issue. And uh, Mr. Olson, who's the region director from Region 4, has indicated that there won't be any problems on their side. So we can only take that for, for its word from, from their side. So it's a matter could, of the two bodies just doing a formal adoption of the IGA? Correct. And, and you're I expecting that by? By the end of November. Okay. I would note it's on the city council agenda for November 10th. So it's scheduled. Um, George and then Bob. And we have a city council member who says she's voting for it. <laughs> uh, Mr. Slater, I mean, um, I seem to recall that there was a similar underpass for baseline that was submitted and granted funding in this last TIP process. Is this the same project or is this a different project? No, this is a, a project for the 2012 to 2017 TIP. And so for the, 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 the current TIP that was awarded just this past, uh, this past fall, we don't have a project on baseline. We have 30th and Colorado underpass. And then we also have a, a Boulder Slough uh, multi-use path and then North Broadway reconstruction. So there's not a baseline. Uh, underpass in, the, in the, the most recent tip. Thank you for clarifying, clarifying that for me. Okay. Chop, chop. Chop, chop. Um, the consequences, does this apply for the exception? So the consequence does still apply even if we grant it? Correct. Okay, and the applicant is fully aware of that, I'm assuming? Correct. Okay. So Further comments or discussion on this project? Sounds like we want to resolve each one by one. So I think we need to entertain a motion. Commissioner Holland. Madam Chair, I move that we uh, grant the extension on this project. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any more discussion? Madam Chair, if I may clarify, is that the 120-day variance? Correct. Thank you. Was there more discussion, George? Thank you, Madam Chairman. Yeah, I would actually encourage a no vote. I, I just don't, it does, it's $4 million that's tied up right now. 
and it just seems like um, there's still too much work to do to tie up $4 million. Um, I would encourage a no vote. Any further comments? Don. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I agree with uh, Councilman Teal. Um, in this case, this is something that we pride ourselves in Jefferson County of, of working closely with CDOT and knowing which roads, um, as, you know, and sending out reference um, and referrals to CDOT, knowing and, and doing our homework prior to tying up $4 million. Um, what really concerns me here is we have $4 million that have been tied up for over two years that could have gone to another project where those applicants, those people who were ready, those municipalities, those counties that were ready to go, who had everything in line and could have used those dollars, these dollars have sat on the sideline and have not been applied and have not been used for what they were intended to be used for. And when there is still no guarantee that the IGA will be signed. Um, this is a lack of doing homework. This is a lack of knowing um, and coordinating with CDOT. And I feel that we all are suffering uh, for that lack of due diligence here where those dollars could be used elsewhere. Thank you. Suzanne? Well, you may not be surprised that um, I would urge a yes vote um, to allow us to proceed. Uh, there's a lot of work that's been going into this. and. Uh, you, if, for those of you that have been to Boulder Baseline and Broadway, this is a major intersection and it's very complicated and a lot of stuff going on there. And um, CDOT has a desire to treat this as a state highway and it's very much, there's a lot more going on in here. So there's been a lot of work to try to finagle this and you guys have all dealt with bureaucracies that have their own, insist on their own way of doing things. Anyhow, we're very close to signing on the dotted line and um, this is going to be a major public safety improvement and really um, there's a lot of important elements to this project in terms of people flow and um, not right now we have a blinking crosswalk across this major route that needs to be replaced with an underpass. So anyhow, um, we have been working really hard to make this happen and we're very close and I would urge you to grant us a variance and we'll take the hit for not having met the deadline. Bob. Uh, oh, and then Ashley. Sorry. I'll, I'll support uh, the extension, but I, I think it's only fair to clearly say on the table that it's a new process in what we're doing and all communities should be on notice that it's unacceptable to tie up $4 million or $5 million or $1 million uh, when the rest of the community could have moved forward on other projects. And so I'll support it because it is new and we're, and it's just my opportunity to put everyone on notice that in the future you will probably see more of a no vote from me uh, on it unless there's a clear uncontrollable circumstances that, is, that has driven the delay. And we're saying way outside of us, usually federal government, railroads, <laughs> things that are beyond us. So just want to make the statement. Thank you. Ashley? Thank you. I absolutely agree with Commissioner Rozier's frustration with tying up this amount of money for so long, but I think it would be short-sighted to then start all over at this point. So I'm s supportive of the 120 days because I think to start over is a waste of that two years of money that's already been spent toward getting this project going, and, after, and they'll take the penalty. And I think it should be a signal to every, every one of us we need to spend the money that we're awarded because these costs are going up. And after 120 days, I hope to not hear about this again because then I think I would feel very differently about it. Great. Are we ready to vote? So we have a motion to approve the 120-day variance. Can, can we clearly state for the Boulder project when we make these motions, actually call out the, the project for the record? wasn't my motion, but um, so the motion, as I understood it, was to approve a 120-day 120 variance for the City of Boulder Baseline Bike Ped Underpass, which is TIP ID 2012-046. And we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Actually, why don't we do a um, show of hands? So all in favor, please raise your hand. All opposed? Motion passes. All right, let's move on to the second project, which is 
the Greenwood Village project and I'll speak to Mayor. It. Uh, basically, is the holdup has been uh, getting the proper signatures for the easements. This is all in a commercial area, and we suffer or are blessed, I'm not sure which, with m many of our commercial projects being owned by REITs, which are based in New York, Boston, L.A., and we've had some property manager uh, changes, and that slowed down and actually caused a restart of the process. So the bottom line is... Um, it's just a matter of getting the right person uh, to give approval for the signatures. And I will make the personal commitment that uh, this will get done if I have to go knock on doors by myself. So do we have additional questions about the Greenwood Village project? I'd see Commissioner Holan and then Bob. Well, I, will, I will reserve my time for uh, Bob. Bob? And, and what, how's your feeling and successful of beating down doors? I mean, you think you'll get it done in 120 days? Yes. Okay. Commissioner Holland. Uh, I move that we approve uh, the 100-day extension on this specific project. Second. 120 days. So just to be clear, 120-day variance for Greenwood Village's Plaza Boulevard sidewalks project, which is 2012-006. I believe we have we have a motion and a second. Further discussion. All in favor, please raise your hand. All right. Opposed. It was unanimous. Okay. Let's move to project number three, which is the um, City of Thornton's project. Um, Bob, you had mentioned you wanted an explanation. You found one in the letter. Do you, would you like further explanation? Uh, yeah, let's keep them all treated equally and let them. Um, Val, would you like to give that or would you like to have your staff? Uh, I, I can have my staff come forward and, and mention it, but uh, I just want to mention that, yes, we, we kind of outlined the, the, the reasons why on the letter itself, but for in case you hadn't read it, uh, we'll have staff go ahead and go through it. Great. Good evening. I'm Dan Schultz with the City of Thornton. I'm the project manager for the Fast Tracks Trails project. Um, there's there's several reasons why we're delayed on this project. Um, I'd like to start with just kind of quickly running through the schedule and the events that sort of transpired and led up to the delays. Uh, we went after the funds back in 2012, and at that time, the uh, current project for the RTD Fast Tracks wasn't coming until 2040. We didn't know that RTD was going to receive an unsolicited proposal back in 2013 um, to build the rail line today. So we went after the funds and we were planning on building the trails in alignments that would serve the stations in what we projected to be the 2040 configuration. So. We started planning the project that way. We started preparing RFPs and, and, and going after our consultants in that way. And along in mid-2013, um, we realized that RTD Fast Tracks was going to be coming much sooner than we had anticipated. And at that time, we, we came to believe that it didn't make sense to go forward with the project at that time. We didn't want to build sidewalks and trails that wouldn't work with the future RTD stations. Um, you know, when you look at those stations individually, uh, you know, initially at uh, the 88th Avenue station, we were going to have a uh, at-grade crossing at 88th Avenue. Well, now it's grade separated, which greatly changes how the, the trails are laid out. You know, moving north to the 104th and 124th Avenue stations, if you look at you know, what was planned in the 2040 EIS, you know, the, the design has changed greatly. The tie-in points are, are different at those two stations, and those are all locations where we're going to be building sidewalks. Uh, up at 144th Avenue, as it turns out, you know, we're, we're planning to move forward with sidewalks there. That, that station isn't, isn't even going to be built uh, at this point in time. So we've experienced huge changes in design, and had we moved forward with the project at that time, uh, you know, we would have been wasting some of this funding. Uh, but 
moving forward, we are committed to getting this done. We've, we've got our design and environmental consultant on board. Um, they are currently moving forward with getting our right-of-way plans uh, approved. I've been in contact with CDOT, with Penny Clemens over there, the right-of-way manager, uh, frequently to uh, just ensure that they're committed as well as Thornton to getting the right-of-way plans uh, completed. Um, in time and to satisfy the 120th 20 day uh, time extension um, I you know personally this is my my number one priority <laughs> for the next three months to, to ensure that this happens so I just want everybody here to know that we're committed thank you questions Val uh, yeah I, I, and I guess I just wanted to kind of emphasize on it that had we gone through and completed the project the way we were headed to, we would have ended up with, uh, you know, the old phrase of a bridge to nowhere. Uh, our our trails wouldn't have matched up with the stations the way the RTD actually changed them. So that was the reason why we actually uh, held back on it and waited until RTD had uh, probably 60, 90 percent of, of the design done. Then we figured that's the way we're going to go about it. So that's the reason for it. Thank you for that. Further discussion, questions, comments? I see George and then Bob and then Val. Uh, so Doug, just one more time, what, what's the uh, amount of money that's uh, uh, kind of on the hook here? It is, yeah, 185000 Okay. So uh, Val, I'm really tempted to vote no on this one just because it, the association with the whole fast tracks boondoggle that has plagued us for nearly two decades now but it the the amount is not even the cost of an average home in the Denver area <laughs> if I recall properly I mean I, I I think I can get get by with supporting a 120 day uh, uh, extension um, the, the money's not that great and it does sound like uh, uh, Val your your young man uh, running this project is is indeed committed to getting it done so I think I would vote yes on this. So it's so on Bob and then Gabe, and Val and then Gabe. Of course if we grant an, uh, an exception or an extension, I want to make sure you're successful. And one thing you, you referred to is still acquiring right away. It worries me a little bit that you're going to acquire right away within the next, really it's 90 days now. Um, you, you, you feel very confident that that's, because I mean you end up losing it, I guess, if you're not at advertisement yet right the the deadline we're trying to meet is to get the right-of-way plans completed so um, you know the the right-of-way acquisition is going to be a, a, a slightly later phase and so you know this is just strictly asking for an extension for the the plans themselves not the full right-of-way acquisition which will give us a little bit more time to get that completed okay, yeah. okay. Madam chair if I may just the, oh. yeah I mean the milestone that they have to accomplish for this is the initiation of right away, which we did, which we which we clarify or are determined to be the completion of the right away plans and submit it to, to uh, CDOT. Okay, and then I just want to want to make a fair comment. Like I've said before, I mean they're all aware. Every requester here is aware that there is consequences to to this, and I want to make sure Thornton understands it. And I don't want to make sure I said that under the bolder discussion, but. Equally, everyone understands that there's a consequence associated to, to the delays. Val? Well, I, I was going to and make the motion to uh, approve a 120-day uh, delay on the, uh, this particular project. So we have a motion and a second just to clarify the motion. It's on the North Metro Rail bike ped access to fast track station in the city of Thornton, TIP ID 2012-081. Um, and Gabe, you had your hand up to speak. Thank you. Um, no, I, as has been mentioned before, this, all municipalities and, and counties should go on notice that, yeah, this is a new process. We had a very vigorous discussion uh, when, I think it was Wheat Ridge that came up the last time. Um, I voted for the other two. I will vote for this one as well. I mean. George, no, no one knows the, the hardship of RTD, the more than Longmont. Still waiting, <laughs> 2070. 
I'll take I'll take it to the uh, to, to the cemetery if, you're lucky. if I'm lucky. Um, but again, I have notified staff, our staff, that there is penalty. You got 120 days. Wrap these projects up, um, as it was mentioned earlier regarding uh, the Boulder project, four million dollars, uh, eight hundred thousand dollars, one hundred eighty-five thousand dollars. So of other projects that could have gone forward get it going and uh, hopefully we won't have these requests come as often as apparently as they are now. Does anybody else uh, wish to speak on this point or are we ready to vote? So we have a motion and a second. All in favor please raise your hands. All, all opposed? Motion passes unanimously. All right. You guys are really holding me to making it out of here on nine. So <laughs> item number two is um, the Station Area Master Plan and Urban Center Planning Studies. And I just want to say for the record, this did pass unanimously before TAC and the RTC. Just saying. <laughs> Plant the uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So again, yes, this is about the uh, stationary master planning and urban center set aside uh, project or study recommendations for 2016-2017. I will do my best. The presentation is in uh, the packet. Uh, this is attachment E. I think it's page 27, uh, the PDF. So we are, we are looking for uh, a motion to recommend or approve uh, these projects. I will just zip through this real quick and hit the highlights. Um, so this, this is a set aside program that the board established as part of the 16 to 21 uh, tip. There's actually four years of funds associated to support uh, these efforts, and th this is really a call for, for studies for those first two years, so fiscal years uh, 16 and 17. Um, we, uh, the board actually approved um, this set aside in the process uh, to uh, move forward with this call for studies back in April. We had a call for projects or a call for studies in May. Uh, we received 17 applications over that sort of five or six week um, time frame from all, all types of eligible um, entities, local governments, uh, uh, TMAs, as well as RTD. Uh, as is mentioned in the memo, and this, this graph also shows, we actually received well over twice uh, the number, uh, twice the federal, the amount of requests for federal funds, and we actually had funds available. So a lot of interest um, in this program um, over this uh, next two-year period. Uh, what this chart really does is just sort of say there are four eligible uh, study types, and we actually received interest in, in all of the eligible uh, study types, which is certainly um, good to see. Um, quick kind of overview of sort of the, what the re review committee and selection process was like. I guess the key headline here is um, this is not Dr. Cog's staff recommending uh, these studies to you all. This is actually a, an independent uh, evaluation panel that, that the board asked to, to be involved. And so that's really what you're seeing uh, this evening. Um, our role was really to kind of play administrative support, get the group together, send the applications, answer questions for applicants, um, that sort of role. Uh, so there are the recommendation, as the chair mentioned, that does come with a recommendation from TAC and RTC is to fund uh, seven studies with a total of totaling $1.15 million um, over the next two years. Um, each of those study requests are funded in full based on this uh, recommendation. Uh, that does leave $50,000 of federal funds that are unallocated, and that's actually an item that we'll talk on. Uh, you will discuss in the next agenda item. Uh, not only was RTC and TAC's uh, recommendation to you unanimous, so was the evaluation panel that ultimately uh, submitted the original uh, seven uh, recommendations. So these seven are, are in your packet. As noted, uh, they do come with a recommendation from RTC and TAC. Um, the actual sort of way that the studies um, sort of aligned by study type was actually almost mirrored um, really kind of how the applications um, that came in the door in terms of percentage of funding requested and that really was not something the committee tried to do. Um, it just sort of worked out that way which, is, which was also good to see. Um, one, that, one small note um, on this, um, each of the uh, awardees um, we'll have a small uh, fee charged to them um, by RTD. RTD is actually the contracting entity uh, for these funds. Um, over the past year, they, the, the amount of uh, administrative requirements in RTD to get these um, projects up and running has really increased. Um, so we worked closely with RTD over that year to kind of get to uh, a fee structure that, that made sense uh, for these projects, and, and we were able to get there. So for um, a, a project of $250,000, it re really works out to under 2.5%. Um, in terms of an admin fee, which we think is, is pretty reasonable. 
Uh, so the, uh, the potential motion in front of you this evening is to move to uh, approve the attached list of projects for the stationary master plan urban center set aside for fiscal years 2016 and 17. Thank you, Brad. John? Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. Um, uh, Brad, as I was looking at the packet when I received it, um, the, the Town of Parker information on this submittal was inconsistent with the final application that I got and my staff uh, submitted to you. Can you give us some background? on uh, what the inconsistency was? Sure, so I, I believe the packet refers to um, uh, the total funding request for, for Parker study of $90,000 federal. Um, and that was what, what ultimately happened is that was a, a draft version of the application that, that Parker submitted to us when they submitted their final um, application. They actually changed that funding request and we just we, we failed to sort of follow through with, with making sure that correct um, funding request was 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 carried through um, uh, so that all the materials reflect that. I believe that the the correct amount was seventy five thousand two hundred, something like that, and eighteen thousand eight hundred dollars um, in in local match. And so that is the the correct amount that was was requested by by the town. So was the was the funding uh, match requirement for this specific application? Yeah, so, uh, well, all, all um, applicants and, and eventual awardees are required to match 20% of the, of the federal amount, or the 20% of the project cost. So the committee in TAC, seeing this, could have just dismissed this because the, the match was not in place. Is that correct? Um, actually, no. We, we, they, they focused on the, particularly the, sort of the original um, committee focused on the actual submittals themselves. Um, that was the thing that we committed to them is that anything related to numbers and funding and match, we would work out with, with sponsors um, after the fact. So they really focused on the actual content um, of each submittal and not, and not necessarily the, the funding amounts requested or, or, or even the match. And, and again, some of the feedback I got was because of, of, the, of the draft as opposed to the final, uh, it was unclear and uh, there, was, there was no way to really advocate or, or even consider something like that. So, I mean, for me, I, I, don't, I don't know what to do at this point being Parker. Um, having a draft being considered when we submitted the final through no fault of our own wasn't wasn't presented in full to to the committee so I don't I don't know what to do I think I'll talk about that in item 13 Herb? on we have 17 applicants that were turning in. We're, we're recommending an approval of seven of the remaining 10 is there any kind of a prioritization list that was they they're ranked as this is the ones that are most important, one of the highest score? Because in the follow-on item that we're going to deal with, there's some funds, but I'm not sure that that funds would actually even finance one. Uh, so there, uh, the way that the the committee was really set up, um, they they ended up focusing most of their time and attention on identifying the seven uh, to be funded. Uh, there was sort of an, an, an initial preliminary um, scoring that the committee did, um, but, but really has not been finalized. So, for instance, not to jump ahead to items, but if you go to the next item, uh, one of the things that staff would do um, if you do decide to uh, make that $50,000 available is to re-engage that committee to make sure for those remaining 10 that we have an idea of what their priorities would be in order so that we could start from, from 1 down to 10. Further comments, motions? Uh, Ashley, do you? So you guys, when you put your hand up, just go ahead and put it up. Thank you very much. I, next time I will. Uh, I do want to just um, comment on uh, what Parker was talking about. I, I don't think uh, our, our projects are almost identical. They're the same amount. They're very, very similar projects. We're similar sized towns and similarly distanced from Denver. So I don't necessarily feel like your project would have been scored differently because ours also wasn't funded. So I feel like we probably are in a very similar boat. Um, I think the projects that were selected are, have a lot of merit. All the projects had a lot of merit. And so I support the recommendation. But in the future, I think maybe we should consider uh, some amount of money in the station area master plan process for small communities. Because while the ones that were awarded definitely were the best ones, with the criteria listed, um, it, it, it's almost impossible for a small community to compete for the station area master plan funding. And I, I see the value in having the big areas have the majority of the funding because our people are going to your communities. But if you want people from the suburbs taking transit in, 
to Denver and Boulder, they need to be able to get on the transit and there has to be a station area. So we do need to at least at some point come up with a way to get these little communities funded as well. Thank you. Bob uh, I, and then Robin. Well, I was going to make the motion, but if Robin has some questions. No, I was going to vote. Okay. If there's not any other questions, I'll go ahead and make the motion. Do you want me to say the motion, or are we good? <laughs> since since staff wrote it for us, should we just look at it and? So the motion would be to move, approve. Move, yeah, move to approve the attached list of projects for the station area master plan urban center set aside for fiscal years 2016 and 17. So we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Uh, Shakti. I just want to follow up with what Ashley said. What do we do if we want to consider? whether to consider smaller communities in a different way next time. How will we remember that? I will certainly remember it. Um, and, and every time this, this, this call for studies happens, this, this body um, adopts the eligibility and review and evaluation criteria. So you will see this again in, I would guess, 14 to 15 months. And, and this came up at both TAC and, and today, so this has been noted. Great. Thank you for that. So. We have a motion and a second. No further discussion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Is that an op uh, oppose? So one against? No abstentions? We move on to the next item, which is what to do with the remaining $50,000. And if, as I understand it, um, if we want to spend it now, we will direct staff to go back to the same set of committees and go through their process. Correct. So and I, it, I don't really have much to say. I think the memo pretty much lays it out. Um, we, we suggested two options. It can either roll forward um, to uh, the next two-year period or we can go ahead and do it now. Those are really kind of the options um, on the table. Um, I will mention the one Herb did sort of bring up is $50,000 enough. Um, and we were, the, the, the requests that, that are sort of that were unfunded range from 75 to 80,000 federal on the low end all the way up to $200,000, right? So. I, I very much expect if someone requested $200,000 federal funds and only 50 is available, that may not be a right fit for them, mm -hmm. right? But, but someone that only requested 75 or 80, uh, maybe this is something that's a, maybe a little more doable. Okay. Herb? I'd like to go ahead and make the motion and, and ask staff to uh, recommend offering the remaining balance in the stamp you see set aside at fiscal year 17 and 18 to studies that applied for but did not receive funds from FY16 or 17. Second. And then I have a discussion. Uh, so we have a motion and a second. Um, further discussion, Herb? Yes. Uh, my concern with part of this was the fact that we've got 50000 If we delay this, that's not going to be 50000 next year. It'll be even less the year after. So I'm proposing we move ahead. But I'm concerned that we've got somebody that can really use the full 50000 uh, So I, I think asking your group to go back to reevaluate that and then contact the applicants if they're willing to take less and they're up toward the end, top of the list, then that's their option. But I really would rather see us commit the funds when we're going to get the biggest bang for those dollars. Great. George? And then John? I will uh, echo almost to the, to the letter what Herb just uh, suggested. I mean, I think now's the time to go if we, you know, we heard from the smaller communities, we heard from Parker, you know, I, I think if, if they can use the 50000 let's give them that opportunity. Great. John? Uh, yeah, I, I can speak for Parker. I mean, Parker, um, the, the application indicated that you needed to ask for a minimum of $75,000. Um, so, I mean, for us being, uh, I think it's $93,000, uh, our, our ask, uh, we were more than happy to, to uh, match more. Uh, but based on the application, uh, it, it didn't... It didn't it seem inconsistent, uh, or at least that's what I got. So um, I guess for me, 50,000 uh, could be used. This is the second phase of, uh, of a master plan, which uh, once we came to the end, we engaged um, um, uh, Dr. Cog, and they, they helped us out with trying to create elements to put into the scope. Great. There's not up, oh, Jennifer. Yeah, I just to John's point. Um, I want to remind everyone that CDOT has really frowned on having to deal with small contracts, and that's, that's why there was a minimum set. Um, um, 
but and I'm sure we didn't like talk to see Todd <laughs> at this point to see if you know how they'd feel about yet one more uh, smaller contract. But that is why a minimum is set because if we didn't. <laughs> then CDOT would have to deal with lots of very small uh, contracts in some cases, and the administrative overhead associ excuse me, associated with that, um, they would say, is not worth their time uh, and, and taxpayer money. So that's why it was set at 75. But as others have pointed out, that money is uh, very most likely worth more today than it would be in a couple of years in the next cycle. So we'll absolutely see um, who might be able to use it. Great. So it sounds like we're ready to go ahead and vote. All in favor of the motion? Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. And now we'll move on to the travel demand management projects. Good evening. I'm going to try and keep this as speedy as possible, like Brad. My name's Melina Dempsey, and I'm pleased to present the Travel Demand Management, also known as TDM, set aside project recommendations for fiscal years 16 and 17. So just a brief overview, the TDM set aside is comprised of projects that reduce uh, single occupant vehicle travel throughout the region. They're two-year projects that will be funded in fiscal year 16-17 with federal CMAC funds. Uh, the program is made up of projects um, that typically have been marketing and outreach in nature. Um, and new to this TDM cycle, uh, small infrastructure projects are eligible as well. We received, um, or in terms of eligibility, our member governments, the TMAs, and TDM nonprofits are eligible. And the Dr. Cog board approved the process back in April, which included um, the approval to assemble a project review panel, which would review the applications and make the recommendation. So we received 18 applications, uh, five infrastructure, and 13 marketing and outreach. Some examples, by secure bike parking at transit stations, uh, real-time transit signage, and transit passes. And all, I'd say some, if not all, of the projects are multimodal in focus. And we received applications from our jurisdictions, TMAs, and nonprofits. In terms of the funding, the total request was $3.24 million, which is just about a million over what is available, uh, the $2.3 million that you see there. And as I mentioned, we had a review panel to review, evaluate, and recommend all of the projects that we received. It was made up of nine panelists, including five members from TAC. Uh, there was 14 criteria, um, and the projects, we met over three different meetings. The projects were recommended based on everything you see here on the box, plus some um, innovation, the quality of the applications, and scope of work, as well as the scores. So moving forward to the recommendations, the panel is recommending funding for 11 projects. That includes four infrastructure and seven non-infrastructure projects. Uh, recommending to put one on the wait list, uh, which is listed in Table 1 as well. The panel recommendation was unanimous, and, and as well as the uh, TAC and RTC. So Table 1, uh, in your packets, it includes all of the recommended projects. The top area includes the infrastructure projects, four being recommended here. The bottom section are the non-infrastructure projects, uh, which includes seven projects plus the wait list. And in the very right-hand column, if there's funding listed there, that is the one that's being recommended. Those are the ones being recommended. And moving forward to the motion, that, are there any questions? Questions for Molina? Seeing none, we entertain a motion. Suzanne? I make a motion. I move to approve the attached list of projects and associated wait lists for the regional TDM set aside for fiscal years 2016 and 2017. Second. We have a motion and a second. Further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? 
Abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Um, we now move on to the uh, cycle two amendments to the 2040 RTP for the purposes of air quality conformity modeling. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. Jacob Rieger, Dr. Cox staff. I do not have a presentation, so I'll be very brief. Um, we amend our fiscally constrained regional transportation plan typically in two cycles a year. So the subject tonight is our second cycle of 2015 amendments. The subject of amendments are major capacity projects that we individually identify in the plan because they're significant for air quality purposes. Uh, so we're looking at major roadway projects. Um, in, in this amendment cycle, we actually only have roadway projects, but typically they are um, major roadway projects, sometimes interchanges, rapid transit projects, et cetera. Um, the projects that are in your packet, both in table format and then in map format, which is also up on the screen, uh, these are uh, primarily projects that are, many of them are already in uh, the fiscally constrained regional transportation plan, um, but perhaps they're being moved up or down um, a air quality staging period. So maybe a project that was kind of farther back in the plan is moving up uh, or vice versa. Um, or there's maybe a scope change in the project that we want to reflect. Some of these projects are also um, locally initiated uh, by you all, by your staff, uh, to be consistent with your local capital improvement uh, programs for uh, funding schedules of projects. We are not asking you to approve these projects this evening. Uh, you will do that through a normal or typical, excuse me, through our typical uh, public hearing process. Uh, we'll have a public hearing on these amendments early next year uh, and then we'll bring these to you uh, after that uh, to actually approve the amendments. What we are asking for tonight uh, is for you to approve um, these projects being put into our transportation networks that we model for air quality conformity. Um, and if we get your go ahead to do that this evening, we will proceed uh, with that transportation and air quality conformity modeling. We will bring that back to you, as I said, early next year, uh, along with the public hearing, uh, show all of that to you, and at that time ask you to approve uh, the amendments themselves. So tonight we're asking you to approve adding these projects. Uh, the motion would be to uh, the transportation networks for air quality conformity modeling. Uh, uh, to proceed with cycle two amendments. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Jacob. Questions? Laura? I'm sorry. And, and I did read the, on my computer. The, and, and I did look at that picture really seriously. But what is the impact of not approving this? If you took out 42 squiggly lines in a blue, <laughs> I mean, what, what is it that, I, I understand that this is what you want to study, but why in the world do you have to ask us this? Because uh, do we really have the knowledge to understand the impact of not approving this? Sure, that's a good question. So let me clarify a couple things. What you're actually seeing on this map, and this is the map that's in your packet, um, all of the squiggly lines, so to speak, are all of the projects in our fiscally constrained regional transportation plan. Um, so those projects have already been approved. What we're using that as a base simply to show you the locations of the few projects which are shown in the kind of orange and reddish circles up there, um, the locations of the few projects that are proposed to be amended. So really it's just to kind of give you context um, of where these projects are in the context of all the projects in our fiscally constrained regional transportation plan. The reason we're bringing this to you is frankly simply a courtesy. Uh, we want you to see these projects, you know, we do this, as I said, twice a year. Uh, typically we solicit amendments. Um, as we get them in, we kind of want to notify you uh, what projects that we have gotten in the door, uh, projects that we'll be modeling so that when they come to you through the public hearing process and, and the actual approval process early next year, you'll know that you'll have seen them already and at least, you know, are aware that these are kind of out there and being analyzed as opposed to seeing them cold, you know, the night four months from now when we ask you to approve them. Other questions? Motions? Herb? I move to include all proposed projects shown in attachment one and air quality conformity modeling networks for 2015 cycle two amendment to the 2040 fiscal constrained regional transportation plan. Whew. <laughs> Say that three Thank times. Thank you very fast. much. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, did we have a second? 
So we have a motion and a second. Further discussion? All right. All in favor, please say aye. aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. And now we move on to the discussion of the air quality letter on ozone. Great. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, last month, the board discussed the pending new federal ozone standard, which uh, the turn did pass, or sorry, did, did I, I guess, publish um, on October 1st of 70 parts per billion. And we also talked about the concern of the rule change that, that doesn't really adequately address the background ozone levels, uh, specifically the ozone transporter from other states and, and countries. Um, at the board's discretion, staff drafted the attached letter in your packet to EPA expressing the importance of accelerating this, this discussion. Um, and just so you, I mean, we know that EPA recognizes background ozone as a significant issue, particularly in the western states, and in fact, um, RAC has informed us that, um, that EPA is currently developing a, a white paper on background ozone and does plan to hold some workshops in, uh, in the coming months. So that is, is certainly good news. So the letter is somewhat timely in that respect. Um, the letter itself um, highlights past studies, including EPA's own study that supports the claim that Denver is among some of the highest background ozone, the Denver area is among uh, some of the highest background ozone areas in the country. Um, the letter speaks to the need for more education and better understanding of the role of background ozone uh, before implementation of the standard. Um, we do note in, uh, in one of the paragraphs um, two Clean Air Act provisions that, deal, that, that need further research. We talk, refer to the Good Neighbor provision, which is, um, re, uh, deals with interstate um, transport. And uh, Section 179B of the Clean Air Act, we're dealing with uh, international transport. So um, be happy to take any comments, suggestions uh, about this letter. Um, it's, it's available for your, for your consideration. Thank you, Doug. And Chair's prerogative, uh, um, I, uh, if you may recall, I was one of several people that was not particularly excited about sending a letter to EPA on this topic, and I want to commend staff on putting together a draft that I think is very balanced and focused on implementation. You know, states are a commitment to air quality, but talks about our specific implementation issues, and I think uh, there were a lot of cooks in the kitchen in terms of providing edits to really focus it, and it's, it's certainly something that I can live with as a result, so I want to thank you for that, um, and I'm prepared to support this. Any questions, comments? On the letter, uh, yeah, Up. I just want to make sure as we agreed that I think the chair would sign it, uh, and right here the executive director. We just the letter needs to be, yeah. It, it, but we made a clear mo discussion around who would sign it. So and it's in the notes. So Wait, for this letter or the drive letter? Uh, no, it's for this letter. It says here we were talking about. Um, uh, well, let's see. What is this about? Those down federal legislative issues. Oh, I do. It's it's on the other letter. I think it. it, it was I think it was, letter. but it, yeah, whoever, if whoever. folks. I, I, well, it doesn't matter. I'm not gonna sign it. <laughs> <laughs> federal government. I've I've already I've already pissed off the federal government, <laughs> so. <laughs> But can, can yeah I don't I don't know way I to mean, raise the issue and then not resolve it <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I don't mind I just want to make sure it has the proper attention and if we're going to go through the political uh, power of it you know we want to make sure it's it it, it has and enough teeth in it to to take us seriously Gabe really would like to say something on it, this no I don't want to sign I was going to make the motion that you sign it but I'm not going to how about just the dual signatures the the, the chair and the executive director good idea okay. beautiful. Does that accompany a motion that we approve this? I approve with dual signatures, the executive director and the chair. We have a motion and a second. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? All right. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Although. So um, we are at 840, and Steve is going to provide us with a scintillating report on congestion, which he promises to do in 10 minutes. But it is the condensed, so it won't be quite as, as exciting. So you have one more cook in the kitchen here. Um, 
Ha, ha, ha. My name is Steve Cook, the MPO Planning Program Manager, and I lead our congestion. Uh, let me pull it up or hit the wrong one. There we go, slideshow. There we go. At, at too many slides. We need to reduce that to four. This is, this is in your attachment, in your memo, uh, attachment J, page 76 of your uh, PDF, purple document like this. We do this every year. It's part of our federal requirements to, as part of our monitoring of uh, congestion around the region and every place around the country does something similar to this. A basis of the report, and Shailen kind of kicked this off uh, earlier this evening, um, is we've got congestion. I don't know if we can get it down to zero too quickly. You know, I'm, I'm with them on that goal. I think we all are, but we're, we'll try to work towards that. That we're probably always going to have some level of congestion um, all across the region from, you know, Loveland Pass uh, here by, uh, or not, or Loveland Ski Area by the Eisenhower Tunnel to our Colorado Boulevards and to freeways across the region. Um, there is this kind of chicken and egg dynamic that does go on related to congestion. You know, on one hand, congestion can be a sign of a booming economy, um, but then at some point congestion may get so bad for certain businesses that you know, they may not uh, stay or retain those employees. So it's uh, a chicken and egg situation. I'm going to skip that one and go to this. One thing that uh, for the last 10 years as part of our program we've really stressed is what we call our three A's of congestion mitigation, uh, avoiding, adapting, and alleviating. We're probably not going to alleviate too much of it right away, um, but even with some of our bigger projects. We can reduce it somewhat at certain locations, but it's not going to be a massive reduction overnight across the region. But the real keys to a lot of our programs and a lot of the things that uh, local governments do is helping people avoid the congestion, whether it's providing real-time information out there right away to people if there's a crash, if there's extra severe congestion in a certain location, uh, adapting to it. You know, part of it is, well, we know it's congested. We know at rush hour we have to plan on, you know, an extra 30 percent more time to get where we're going uh, than if it was a weekend. So those are the real keys and offering mobility choices, uh, alternative modes. So potentially you can take transit rather than drive through congestion or walk or bicycle if you happen to be close enough to your destination. We've done all kinds of uh, pieces of our congestion mitigation program. We have a toolkit, which is kind of the centerpiece, but we look at, as I mentioned, bicycle, pedestrian, incident management, a real key. Uh, we have incident management plans at several corridors around the region that we've worked with CDOT on. And you probably know how important that is that when an incident occurs, a crash occurs, obviously safety is of the utmost important for the emergency responders and everybody, but the sooner we can clear that off, uh, the better. Typical weekday in the Denver region, just to kind of get a rough picture of what we're dealing with, there's 13 million person trips a day, so that can be walking, driving, passenger in a vehicle, uh, traveling 110 million miles, uh, about 10 million vehicle trips, where there's an actual vehicle being driven, whether it's a car or a truck or a, a plumber's van, burning uh, nearly uh, 4 million gallons of petroleum, uh, about 180 reported crashes per day. Now, that's just reported. We also know there's a lot of incidents out there where it might be a mi really minor fender bender that doesn't get reported or a flat tire. Um, but some of those other incidents can really cause uh, congestion. One element that we report on uh, every year uh, in our congestion report is vehicle miles of travel uh, in an average day uh, for the year. And we've been following this and tracking this uh, over time, or VMT as it's known. And we've ha been going up in our what we call our stage one there on the left, basically since the internal combustion engine was invented, we've been going up in terms of total VMT as well as VMT per person, you know, the amount that each person drives. We had a couple little dips in uh, World War II and the Depression, but those are really, really brief. Um, what we've seen in the, the second phase, starting in about 2006, going through 2011, was where the total VMT in the Denver region uh, was basically flat. It went up slightly, but for the most part it was flat. 
but our V&T per capita in the red dashed line there actually went down. That's the first time ever it was in that little five, six year period there. So um, that was really interesting to see that on average, people were driving slightly less. It wasn't a dramatic drop, as you can see, going from average of 27 to 26 miles per day or whatever that is. In the last three or four years, however, what we've seen is our VMT has started going up again in the region. You know, our economy is booming more, you know, other reasons. And our VMT per capita is fairly flat. It's going up slightly, it, it appears. You know, these aren't real, real precise numbers. Um, but we're seeing kind of this third phase now. What's the fourth, fourth phase going to be in the future? You know, we really, really don't know. Um, some of our modeling at the moment is kind of showing a continuation of increase in VMT with flat or hopefully slightly declining uh, VMT per capita over time. Uh, just want to point out that we look at a lot of different measures at Dr. Cog um, that we calculate for our, our regional roadway system. And it's really looking at measuring it in five different ways to look at these statements that we've probably all uttered at some point in time or have heard, you know, in terms of the duration of congestion, you know, how long was it congested in front of your business for that day, you know, severe congestion. Um, how much of your drive home was congested on uh, last night? Uh, how many thousands of cars were stuck in traffic because of one incident? Uh, variation, we know it's going to take longer uh, to go take your son to a soccer game at five in the afternoon on a weekday than a Saturday morning. Uh, and then the reliability part is, you know, another crash shutting down the road and maybe you couldn't make, if you're a business or doing deliveries, you couldn't make your delivery on time or that delivery didn't get to your business on time or a plumber didn't arrive at your house. So a lot of things like that. We, we have a map in the uh, document that we uh, show where we look at where some of the most severe uh, locations are. We also do region-wide tabulations for our regional roadway system um, where we look at and these massive numbers here that are kind of hard to digest, but a couple of key ones. Our region is growing, as we well know, and we anticipate another 1.2 million people in the next 25 years. So we know there's probably still going to be a growth in vehicle miles of travel. That's that red line there, 26%. Not quite as much as we've been predicting in the past, but still that can be pretty impactful depending on where that occurs. If you're I-25 or a Colorado Boulevard and add 26% more vehicles, that's going to make things worse. Travel delay uh, per resident uh, we still think is going to uh, go up suspense a lot. Uh, <laughs> the number of miles that are you know, designated as severely congested you know, we're predicting at the moment, predicting going up about 65%. Um, it used to be uh, some of our predictions were a little higher than that. Um, but at least on the RTD transit side, you know, we're predicting uh, more than a doubling in transit use by 2040, um, you know, partially because of the uh, new fast tracks lines opening uh, next year and a couple of years after that. One other interesting thing we looked at from our modeling results was kind of the amount of travel during the day by hour. So here it is today, 2014, 2015. You can see kind of the peaks in the morning and then especially the peaks in the afternoon, rush hours, or when most of the uh, driving occurs in the 4 o'clock to 6 o'clock period. So that's 2014. When we took a look at our 2040 model results for 25 years from now, we saw this variation. The shape looks the same, but when you look at some of those red lines, you know, a lot of them that are in the middle of the day are higher than our morning rush hours now, are nearly as high as our PM rush hours now. So it's kind of an interesting thing, uh, a dilemma to consider to see if traffic will really move around to different parts of the day. No, I'm not going to go through that. So we'll skip this one. This one just shows uh, on Google Earth happened to show a crash on US 6 westbound um, heading out towards uh, the Golden area at, and the photo was about 2 in the afternoon, but fairly small incident in the top there. 
cause traffic to back up all the way to I-25 and just stressing the importance of incident management, getting the word out, getting the real-time information out to people. And the last slide uh, that we have on our report for this year is we did some comparisons of different measures around the country by some national organizations, Texas Transportation Institute and the INRIX company that looks at cell phone, basically the movement of cell phones and GPS equipment. And Denver Boulder region, our congestion is pretty comparable to our population. Um, you got some other areas though where uh, congestion is a lot more severe than the population would indicate, like uh, Seattle uh, and Portland. So that's also in the report. So all this information is in the report. If you have any questions, you can ask them now or ask me later or email me. Uh, but it's something that we've been monitoring for 10 years and will continue. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate you uh, summarizing that for us. Shakti, you had a question? I think we have time for one or two questions. I just want to say I really appreciate it, and I think it's the kind of thing a lot of people will be interested in. I'm planning to put it in my newsletter. Oh, good. Wow. <laughs> cool. be happy to come out and talk to any of your organizations, too. Herb? So, Steve, just as a kind of a closing dig at CDOT, you know, hopefully <laughs> at uh, this time next year, right be behind the CU homecoming game, there will be no need for them to put 10 miles of cones down to make eastbound 36 and one lane highway. <clears throat> With no work. <clears throat> not that they, not no that they did it on purpose. Was there. On that happy note, I'm sure Steve would be happy to take questions via phone. Absolutely. So, <laughs> on his way home. Uh, so last thing, we have eight minutes left or seven minutes left, uh, committee reports. Um, I'll start off with stack. Um, there are two new Transportation Commission members, Kathy Hall from Grand Junction and Nolan Schreiner from Colorado Springs. Um, CDOT gave a policy directive 14 report on how it's meeting specific performance measures and things like safety, infrastructure, maintenance. Bottom line is they don't have enough money to meet their performance measures statewide. Not, not probably a huge news flash. Last but not least, the stack received a, a briefing on revenues for the CDOT budget for 2016-17. Basically, they're expecting a decrease of 18% in revenues because they are forecasting zero Senate Bill 228 dollars in the 2016-17 year because the taper thresholds will have been hit. So that's a, the briefing from Stack. Herb, can you give us um, the update yeah, from Metro Mayors? Metro Mayors did have a meeting. Uh, probably the biggest piece that uh, you all need to be aware of is the upcoming SCFD vote that will be going to the legislature for reauthorization 2016. Metro mayors did host both the SCFD group and the opposition to the FCFD proposed formula. Uh, FCFD and then both made a presentation of about half hour, 45 minutes apiece. Uh, the Metro mayors had a serious number of questions to the what's called the FACE group, F-A-C-E as to the number of people signed on in opposition to the formula versus what they can support. We have since sent a letter to them on behalf of the Metro mayors asking for copies of either the letters of support from the organization they reported or copies of the declarations. And we've asked SCFD for the same thing. SCFD has complied. FACE has declined to provide those documents. So as far as we're concerned, they can't support any organization have signed on to it. So we are being asked to support this from a community-wide area. Uh, Metro Mayors has taken serious uh, concern about the fact that they won't provide this or prove that they have it. Uh, we have not taken a formal action since this uh, has just happened after the meeting. But they are still asking going around to different municipalities and to counties asking for us to reconsider the vote we have strongly encouraged FCFD and FACE not to let this get to the legislature next year or they'll never get it refunded. Uh, there was supposed to have been a meeting this week between the two groups, and as far as we know, that did not happen. So uh, this is a big issue for all of us as far as with SCFD funds coming up. It must be reauthorized next year. Thank you, Herb. Um, the uh, Metro Area County Commissioners, Don, do you want to 
Get yeah, it, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we too. It seems like it, they're they're making the rounds, mm -hmm. and uh, we too um, had uh, Floyd Cerulli and also Jim Harrington present on behalf of SCFD. Uh, there was um, quite a bit of discussion on Tier 1, Tier 2, and Tier 3 funding, how those um, dollars would be allocated, what does it take to go into a Tier 1 versus a Tier 2, any movement going on there, and uh, the, the, that whole metrics. So it was a good, robust discussion. I believe they're going to come back and give us more information and supply that to us. We also had them um, as the Jefferson County Board of Commissioners. They came in at one of our briefings and gave us an update and there was also some uh, very robust discussions there. We had uh, proposed legislative uh, priorities for 2016 uh, discussion there. Elise, would you like to add anything in regards to what we discussed? Um, no, nope. uh, I think we'll be looking to finalize that at our next meeting, looking at things like SEFD, um, the affordable housing tax credit, possible um, funding issues, and the um, Workforce Innovation Act implementation. Right. And then also we had a discussion on the upcoming um, 2015 legislative reception, which is December 9th. That's with the MMC and MAC. Uh, we're going to have it at the same location just across the street here at Denver Art Museum. Looking forward to that. Thank you, Great. Madam Chair. Thanks, Don. Um, Jayla. Hello. Uh, I presented the results of the Community Assessment Survey of Older Adults. Uh, this is a survey we do about every five years. It helps us uh, uh, do the four-year plan, understand the strengths and the needs uh, of seniors in our region, and then helps us target our limited funds more effectively in the region. Top needs that were identified in the survey, transportation, housing, information and assistance, and access to community-based services. Uh, we surveyed over 2,005, well, we sent it out to 12,000 residents and only about 2,500 sent it back, but we still got a good feel for what some of the needs are. We also had a presentation or we had a, a visit from uh, John Zabala, who's the Executive Director of Seniors Resource Center, to talk about transportation issues. As you know, we've had some challenges, particularly in Arapahoe County. Um, and he told us uh, kind of how they're handling them, gave us a progress report. Uh, the complaints are down significantly in Arapahoe County, so that's good news, but we still have some work to do. And we're meeting with uh, 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 Arapahoe County as well as um, SRC every month to deal with complaints and uh, solutions to those complaints uh, so that we don't have some of the problems that we did in the first month. That's my report. Great. Thanks so much. Joyce, did you want to report on the RAC? We have a meeting next month. We didn't have one this month. Great. Um, thank you. Ron mentioned there's no E470 report, and so that Bill Van Meter, bring it home. You have 60 seconds. I can do it in less than that. So, in, and I'll cover two meetings of our Fast Tracks Monitoring Committee, the September and October. They had no action items at either Fast Tracks Monitoring Committee meeting in September and October. No action items. They had heard updates from our Citizens Advisory Committee on the Eagle P3 project, on the I-225 rail project, and on the Northeast Area Transit Evaluation. That was the total extent of my report. Yay, it is 9 o'clock and we are adjourned. Huh, is that good or what?